Welcome to Zero Page Homebrew, your best source for the newest Atari games. And today we have a very special show. Mm -hmm. We have an interview with John McCula from Heavy Horse Games. Awesome. And we're going to talk all about his brand new release, Yay. Mr. Run and Jump for the Atari 2600, <clears throat> which is uh, available for pre-order today. Oh my goodness. What timing. It's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> um, we're also going to have the... Uh, Exclusive world premiere of Zark Stars 4 Nebula. Wow. Okay. From Leandro Camera. Oh, something's happened. I can't hear you anymore. Oh, we will fix that. Um, and um, Food Ninja, the final build of Food Ninja um, by Ricardo Pym. Um, let's see. I wonder why I can't hear us anymore. Check, check, check. One, two, three. Just making sure. John can hear us okay. Let me go to my settings here for audio. And it's picking me up through Skype. So maybe check your end there. I'll give you a bit of time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. We got stuck to. There, there we go. Back to full screen. Uh, I want to hello everybody out there in Zero Page Land uh, watching live on Twitch. I want to thank the Twitch subscribers. Mm -hmm. Scrolling down beside Tanya. Right here. Uh, Al Nefar, Arkham H, Arms Guard Coder, Atari Knight 74, Atari H, Beef Supreme, Beer Polka, Buffalo Pinball, Captain Man 2D, Charles John Mel, Charles Wheel, and Chitlilla, Colonel Lamad, Cubanismo, Dianoid, Dana VC, Drexel, Dr. Mukaz, Gamma Dev, Glenn Main, Great Defender, Ground Trooper, Azure Rapper, Johnny WC, Carl G, Ken Jennings, Invader, Croco 2600, Gavelt for Lambda Express, Lundy DZ, Mark Rianis, Mark Space, Sang Metal Atari, McMuse, Mike Soul, McTell, Misk Man, MK Swift, Mother 3, Mr. Zarno with Mr. Fix, Muddy Funston, Nathan Strum, Neo Media, Nostalgia, Coagar 70, Rendered Ghost, Pendus VG, Ricardo Pim, Rod Castle, Sledge Hammer, Smith, be Spicer, S. Ramirez, Teleprompter, Tiki Dan, K, T, Foes, Trek, MD, Vex, or X, VVG, Double Down, X, Ken, X. How are we doing there? Good? Bad? Still working on it? Oh, we're good. Okay. Excellent. <laughs> That's good to hear. John's got his audio going again. If you'd like support the show and you like what you see, um, just subscribe to Twitch. If you have Amazon Prime, it's free. If not, you pay. You pay. <laughs> you will pay. And you will keep the cats fed in treats. Um, uh, I have a poll question, some mail and news, uh, but we'll be doing that after, after. the interview so okay. we don't let uh, John uh, wait too long. Um, but um, I would like to introduce John. I'd like to welcome to the show. An Atari 2600 developer whose debut Atari 2600 game, Mr. Run and Jump from his company Heavy Horse Games, has the designation of being the first new Atari 2600 game to be released on cartridge by Atari in over 30 years and just went on pre-sale today. Please welcome to Zero Page Homebrew, John Mikula. Welcome, John. How are you doing today? Howdy, it's uh, good to be here. Uh, I'm doing really well. Excellent. Yeah, thank you for joining us today on the show. Um, so, let's start with introductions. Tell us a little bit about um, your programming background, your work as a game director and senior programmer at Graphite Lab, and, uh, and what sparked your interest in making a game or programming for the Atari 2600. Why the Atari 2600? <laughs> Why indeed. Uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, so I, I guess my background, I, uh, I, I come from Chicago. Uh, I was, that's where I was born and raised. Um, and I went to a school there that had kind of a dedicated game development program. Um, it was called uh, Tribeca Flashpoint Media Arts Academy. Um, which kind of, quite a mouthful. Kind of, kind of a mouthful, <laughs> yeah. But uh, I don't think it's called that anymore. I think they changed the name to... Now I think it's Tribeca Flashpoint College. Um, so uh, that's a, a bit better. <laughs> a, little, a little bit better. But um, yeah. So they, they kind of had like a... They were all about like the media arts, right? So when you signed up for the, to, to go to the school, you could, you could take one of four tracks. You know, they had one for film, they had one for animation they went for audio and then they had like the game track um uh, so I, I took the game track um because I, I i'd always loved growing up with video games i played games all my life and i 
thought about them a yeah. lot and I thought it was something I wanted to get into. So, um, and so when you, when you sign up for the game course, what they do is you, uh, your first year there is kind of like an introduction to all disciplines in games, right? So you have to take an art class, you have to take a design class, you take a business class, you take a programming class. Ah. Yeah. And then, so that's kind of your, like, your crash course in like everything game development. And then from there, you kind of pick one of those disciplines that you want to like be your focus. Um, okay. So I found that I really grew to enjoy programming. Um, and uh, kind of got into it that way. And, and from there, you know, after I graduated, I was uh, looking at all kinds of, you know, programming jobs in the game development space, you know, and I, I sent my resume all over the country and I sent it to, you know, anywhere that was a, you know, junior developer or, or anything non-senior is what I was going for. Um, but, uh, uh, I, I wound up sending it to, uh, the place where I work, which is, uh, a independent game development studio called Graphite Lab. Um, yeah. and we're here in St. Louis. Um, and so I've been here, uh, uh about 10 years. You know, right around 10 years I've been working at Graphite Lab, uh, got hired as a gameplay programmer, and, uh, you know, since then kind of have, you know, uh, we're a small company, right? So it's not like yeah. there's a huge ladder I needed to climb, you know, it was more just like... <laughs> it was, yeah, I looked at the roster, there's about 8 to 10 people there around that? Yeah, uh, these days we're about 10 people, yeah. Yeah. Um, and it, you know, it, it fluctuates, you know, over those 10 years. Right. But, uh, um, and then, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, from there it was kind of slow growth, kind of just, you know, we, we take on a lot of different projects and so there'd be just cases where I'd be the only programmer on a project and, um, mm -hmm. you know, kind of cut my teeth, you know, making, um, interactive storybooks based on like My Little Pony and <laughs> Transform. Yeah, I saw like that. I, I saw that in your in your resume, <laughs> uh, My Little Pony. Very interesting. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So we were doing like a ton of licensed stuff. We had kind of this like custom uh, framework, I guess, for developing interactive storybook based on like Flash assets. So you know, a lot of those Hasbro shows they were made with you know Adobe Flash and. Um, so we, we would take, you know, scenes from the show and then convert them into our framework. And then you're able to pump them out onto uh, as kind of this like storybook uh, framework and then, uh, you know, sell them on the store that way. Um, yeah, yeah. So we were doing that for a long time. And then uh, in the midst of that, we worked on Hive Jump was kind of Graphite Labs first big original IP, uh, which was a, a game we kickstarted and worked on for a number of years and you know I, I was a big part of that uh uh that's kind of where we got into making like console games and things like that um and uh you know uh after hive jump you know we popped around to a number of different things uh um but uh I, I think it was around hive jump time that i is when i started looking at uh, into homebrew um to yeah. you know, circle back i guess to the the topic of the show <laughs> that's right but uh uh but yeah uh i want to say it was years before any of that happened it was years before college or no maybe it was during college um yeah uh, i want to say it was a game called shakedown hawaii uh yeah was kind of um it was like a like a snes throwback uh kind of top-down action game with kind of that like retro pixel art style and i i, I want to say I actually, I actually did a I actually did a panel with the developer who did shakedown hawaii okay at vancouver retro gaming expo oh gosh gotcha. that's very interesting <laughs> yeah yeah so i i want to say it was that game was the first time i saw someone who because part of that like after that game came out um the developer did like Hey, we did like a SNES throwback, but now we're going to actually turn this thing into a SNES game. And I want to say that was the right. first time I had heard of like homebrew as a thing. Um, right. Okay. And I became like kind of fascinated with it at that point. 
where I'm always like, it was a thing that lived in kind of the back of my mind. I'm like, man, that would be really cool to do <laughs> homebrew of some description, right? Um, right. But, uh, but yeah, so it was around like 2015 that I was playing a lot of NES games. Um, I was, you know, because I, you know, I, I, I grew up, I was born in 93, so I grew up with like a PlayStation. Um, right. Um, yeah, yeah. So that, that era, well, well past the Atari 2600 era, like one year past the discon discontinuation of all of them, actually. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So, yeah, definitely. Like, so I, I, I didn't grow up as like an Atari person, right? I grew up, I grew up thinking the classics were like the Nintendo stuff, you know, I, I grew up thinking right. of Zelda and, 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 and like Mario and Mega Man and Castlevania. I'm like, I'm like, these are like, you know, this is like the Criterion <laughs> collection for Nintendo or for video it's games. the OG stuff. Yeah. I'm like, if I'm going to, I'm going to be in this industry, you know, I want to see, you know, I want to see the greats. I want to see where it all came from, which, you know, is, you know, funny to think, but you know, there's, because there's so much industry before that point. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, but that's what I was doing. I, I got into like collecting Nintendo carts and I was playing, you know, all, all kinds of stuff, you know, uh, trying to, yeah, yeah, bone up on the classics, like I was saying. Um, yeah. And I got to a point where, you know, that thought of homebrew entered my mind again. And I was like, man, it, you know, because I, I, I don't want to you know, puff myself up too much. I like to think I'm a creative guy, right? But uh, yeah, you know, yeah, working yeah. in this industry, you're you're like, oh, you know, yeah. Thinking of game ideas kind of a lot, and I think steeping myself in that kind of Nintendo mindset, I'm like thinking of a lot of like, oh, what if I was to make an NES game? Like, what could I do? And so I really wanted to do that, and I started looking into it. And during that process was when I, I saw, it must have been like forum chatter or something about the Atari 2600. And I saw it kind of lauded as like this big, almost legendary programming challenge where it's like, uh, yeah, where it's like, yeah, like if you want to do homebrew, like these guys doing 2600 stuff, these are the real sickos, you know? And, <laughs> Yeah, it's like it's like they say. Here's six pieces of Lego per line on the screen, and you get to arrange these six pieces of Lego any way you want. Almost, yeah, yeah. Make a game. <laughs> yeah, definitely, right. Um, so I, you know, I my my big plan, my master plan was I would, because it, it feels like such a natural place to start, right? At the twenty six hundred, where you're like, okay, here's like the first kind of cartridge based game. I'm like. I'm like, well, am I going to yeah. start at Nintendo or do I want to, you know, go back and kind of do this, you know, challenge myself, make a 2600 yeah. game, and then I can maybe get to Nintendo. Oh, okay, and, and okay. Yeah. yeah, so that that was kind of my master plan. I'm like, I'm like, I'll, I'll bang out this 2600 game in like a couple months. <laughs> no problem. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, I can do a Nintendo thing and then maybe I can do a Super Nintendo thing and then maybe I can do a right. PlayStation thing. <laughs> Um, and that was my master plan is I'm like, oh, I can, I can make a game through every console generation. Work your way up through the eras. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. But, uh, but it didn't quite pan out that way. I wound up spending uh, a number of years making Mr. Run and Jump, uh, kind of as a, yeah. as a side project, you know, uh, on and off, you know, as work gets busy and all that stuff. And, and yeah, it, it turns out uh, the forums were not lying. Uh, making a 2600 game is pretty hard. Right? Um, it's, it's, it's a challenge. It's quite a challenge. Yeah. I think your microphone is going through your earpiece. I don't know if you can quickly change it in Skype to have your audio input through your mic. Yeah. If that's possible. Yeah. Let me, let me take a look at that. Skype loves to change this setting on me. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Oh, Skype. Okay. How about now? Oh, oh a million wow. times better. There Much better. <laughs> you don't have to be like better. touching the mic now, fumbling with it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's better. Excellent. Glad I made that suggestion. Okay. Um, uh, so you kind of answered uh, some of this next question about owning any Atari consoles or Atari computers growing up. 
So, um, did you what what systems did you play and did you own back in the '90s or 2000s growing up? You know, uh, my parents were um, they were a little. Uh, well, they were they were the type of parent. I, I was going to say strict, but I don't think they were really strict. Uh, they they were the ones they would only let me have like one console, right? So, I mentioned right. uh, having a PlayStation when I was younger, and then I, I kind of stayed in the PlayStation family for a long time. Um, uh, so I had a went from PlayStation. I did PlayStation two to three, and yeah. I, I think it was around PlayStation three era. It, it was it was around when I got my first job. I bought. Uh, a, uh, like a refurbished NES, um, okay. and then so that that was kind of the the start of I guess my console, my classic console collecting. Um, but right, and that and that kind of do- put you on the path towards homebrew a little bit, right? Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, but yeah, I didn't get a a twenty six hundred, a working twenty six hundred until, um, yeah, until I was kind of waist deep in making Mr. Run and Jump um, when I finally right. got to the point where I'm like you know where I learned about like the Harmony cartridge and I'm like ooh okay so I can actually get this running on an actual <laughs> device and not just the emulator uh, so I remember I man I I tried going on like Amazon I tried getting I got one I ordered one from like a third party on Amazon and I got this yeah. thing, and it came in like a paper bag, and I took it out, and the th- <laughs> the thing looked like it had been like buried in the dirt for like oh for like forty years, oh like goodness. it was like covered in like <laughs> grime and muck, and I'm like, Ugh. And Ooh, I, you a, know, a good it's a good project for somebody, but maybe not you at that time, <laughs> right? Yeah, so I you know I I cleaned it off, I you know. I'm like, maybe it's fine. But, I mean, surely they wouldn't send me a broken thing, but, you know, mm. sure enough, they did. Um, oh, no. And then I got another one that looked a lot cleaner, and that one didn't work either. And and then I'm oh. like, maybe these are getting damaged in shipping. And so I, I wound up going on, like, <laughs> Craigslist and, uh, you know, finding someone local who was looking to sell and, and bought something off them. But uh, That's good. That's that's a lot safer. At least you can go there, turn it on, works. Okay, now pay for it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <clears throat> so the so the twenty six hundred you have is it, is it just unmodified? Is it an RF to a to a CRT kind of thing, or uh, did you get it modified with composite or any kind of upgrade? No, it, it's uh, unmodified. Um, just okay. The purest vanilla, um, <clears throat> twenty six hundred. Yeah, I, I haven't really dug into um, like what it would take to mod uh, a 2600 like that or to buy a modded version. Um, right. And and so you said you got the Harmony cart as well, and I guess that's what you used going forward, testing and playing and playing around with it. Uh, yeah, it was a combination of that and, um, and just Stella, you know, the Stella emulator, mm-hmm. um, which, you know, the default kind of or not de- uh like the the debug tools it comes with you know when you hit like the tilde key at like right. instrument like you know absolutely <laughs> like a oh. a wonderful suite of development tools are kind of built straight into that uh really yeah. just it's it, amazing you can see all the ram right on screen right in one chunk it's it's absolutely amazing a little box just like this you know i'm used to like you know the ram is so impossibly big like there's no way you could possibly look at it all like but then you open this up and it's like here's this just like this you want to advance one color (laughs) clock you could do that you know advance one scan line one frame you know uh pause it and you can like set the the set the input of the controller you can trigger things on the exact frame you want it to like it's really wonderful stuff yeah everything's at your disposal to see and input and see the output see the stack pointer everything absolutely everything beautiful beautiful yeah (laughs) and uh carl g who uh programs in atari 7800 he says he really misses the stella debugger when he's doing 7800 stuff yeah um so if anybody has questions um for john while we uh do the interview please go ahead and type them in the chat um so we're going to take a look at some video 
of uh, Mr. Run and Jump for the Atari 2600. We unfortunately weren't able to sort out the paperwork to be able to have the ROM to play today with Atari, um, but we uh, can play some footage from the game. So let me cue that up and so we can take a look at that. There we go. So there's your dog. That that's your your goal to uh, go rescue your dog. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's leap. And is, leap his, the dog. is his full name Mr. Run and Jump, or is it uh, his first name Run and his last name Jump? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think uh, whole name is just Mr. Run and Jump. Uh, <laughs> and then yeah, the the and, leap, uh, dog's name is Leap, and uh, and yeah, that's great. That's yeah. kind of the. Uh, you know that's that's kind of the crux of it is uh you know mr run and jump lives in kind of this uh abstract kind of magic land known as the <laughs> realms of color um and uh, great and yeah uh leap is kind of well i mean you know we kind of dig more into the backstory in the manual if you buy the uh if you buy the the <laughs> printed cartridge from atari but uh leap is yeah. kind of a newcomer to the realms of color and uh, Mr. Run and Jump sees him and sees him running off and Leap is running towards what's known as the Dark Realm, right? Which is the realm where no color exists. And uh, so if Leap... Silly dog. <laughs> so if Leap goes too far into the Dark Realm, you know, he's not going to be able to make his way back. So you got to catch up to him before he goes too far. Um, right. And I, and I notice that each level you almost catch up to him and then he takes off again, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> and, and I... And this is a game made after my own heart because I love platformers, um, platformers and shooters. So I was uh, immediately drawn to this game as soon as I saw um, the first video of it being displayed and first screenshots posted on the internet by you and your your company. So nice. Um, yeah. So I was like, oh, oh, this is very interesting. And of course, being distributed by Atari is is another layer of interest, but we'll. We'll, we'll get to that. So were there any games that specifically inspired you to make a flip screen platformer like Mr. Run and Jump? Um, not necessarily. Um, so I wanted to, you know, like when you make any games, it's it's a game of trade offs, right? Like, you know, you. And, yeah. and so what I really wanted to do was I wanted to make a kind of a, a level creation framework that would let me make a lot of content, right? Like a lot, a lot of bespoke content. Um, and so my – that was kind of my thought is uh, I'm like, okay, if I can – if I can think of like a single screen as like a unit of a level, right? And then I can have some right. kind of, you know, as you di kind of dig into the technology of how the 2600 works, you can kind of discover like, you know, okay, like I can break up the level into kind of this like coarse grid of, I think it's eight by six, um, is kind of these right. like level block chunks that can make up a single grid. And so I, so I have kind of this really coarse eight by six grid that I can use to make levels. And I'm like, okay, if I can make some simple enemies that I can, I, I want enemies that I can place anywhere in the level. I want that total freedom to place as many as I want, wherever I want them. So, so I wanted like this really kind of clean, basic framework. Um, right, and flexible as well. Yeah. yeah, definitely, that flexibility to, yeah, just pump out as many of this, these screens as kind of I could you know, stand to make or that the, the cartridge would allow me to put on there. <laughs> um, right. Yeah. So, so thinking about kind of what games fit that mold, right? Like, and I'm, I, and I, I've always been a, a fan of platformers. So I'm like, well, you know, with this kind of grid setup, you know, I can make, you know, floors and floating platforms and things like that. And then, uh, yeah. having enemies with kind of these simple patterns that, you know, it, you know, when right. an enemy has like a simple pattern, and then you can lay movement. Yeah, definitely. Like just movement up and down. Or I saw ones growing and shrinking, or moving side to side. Yeah. yeah, definitely. Yeah, just like kind of different movement paths. You know, there's the diamond shape one, and and there's like the the crush them. You know, the falling block one, and um, so like taking these kind of very simple 
you know, enemies and then layering them with multiple of them on a screen, you know, I, I can create uh, more complex challenges that way. And so, you know, one of the goals I think with making kind of classic Mr. Run and Jump was to uh, have like each screen of the game be completely unique, right? Like completely bespoke. You know, I, I don't repeat right. like, you know, the same exact like layout of enemies or the same exact. Well, well sometimes. Just a different color. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. Or it's like I'll I'll reuse sometimes the layout of the screen, like the level geometry, but layer it on with different enemies or more enemies or things like that in order to make it harder and and, and stuff like right. that. So so that, that was kind of a big thing is, you know, every screen needs to be unique. Um, but uh, and, and, and how many screens did you end up uh, being able to fit on to into the game? Uh, I, I forget the exact number. It's over 80. Um, okay. Yeah, because I think I read forty at one point, eighty at another point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it's over eighty. I, I forget the exact number though. And and how big is the uh, is the ROM? Did it end up being? Uh, it wound up being uh, twelve um, kilobytes. Twelve K. Okay. Yeah. 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 So I used three uh, uh, four kilobyte banks um, in there. Nice. Um, Atari 2600 dude has a question in the chat. What was the biggest challenge for you as a programmer developing an Atari 2600 game for the first time? Oh, man, you know, it, there's, you know, there's kind of two big things, right? Like, well, one is the the graphics, right? It's it's chasing the beam, you know, it's... it's uh, <laughs> yes, uh, it's a very different way of, uh, of drawing graphics. It's, you don't draw a sprite, you draw... A line by line and kind of piece together, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And just uh, just getting in kind of that flow of dealing with color clocks and and synchronizing the uh, processor to the cathode ray tube. Uh, so I, I'm mm -hmm. I, I'm I guess I'm I'm kind of assuming that your audience is maybe slightly more informed with I guess the homebrew, <laughs> you know, mindset. Yeah, I guess I, uh, then. I have a big following of developers <laughs> yeah. on the show. Uh, but it's a mixed as well. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, so I'll say, I guess, um, when it comes to rendering, you know, modern games, you know, there's kind of your, you know, there's a layer, right? Like there's your monitor and there's the game, but between that is like your graphics card drivers. Uh -huh. So kind mm. of what modern games wind up doing is like, you know, there's a lot of complicated math and and, and big sets of data and textures and meshes and things like that that kind of get packaged up and sent to your graphics card and then you interface with kind of your graphics card drivers, you know, that's kind of what OpenGL does or like a DirectX yeah. or one of these graphics libraries. And then whenever that's all ready, you say, okay, you're good, present the frame. And then it takes all that data and, you know, draws up <laughs> kind of your, your, your whole, your final screen, you know, you swap the buffers and there you go. Like there's your image. Um, yeah. But yeah, when working with the Atari 2600, you know, there is the, you know, it's very baked in, you know, that middle layer is not there anymore, right? It is all, you know, the console is talking directly to your TV and your TV draws its picture using the cathode ray tube, you know, that, that laser, that color laser beam, you know, line by line. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's advantageous it's powerful but also limiting at the same time welcome 48k ram raiders of 20 <laughs> welcome to the show <laughs> glad you could join us um, we're, we're talking with john mccula whose uh first 2600 game is now out with from atari um sorry continue on with uh the challenges of the programming for the 2600. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, yeah, it's, you know, there's the cathode ray tube and you're trying to like right before, you know, or on the scan line before you are supposed to be like drawing the player, you have to, you know, get your code in sync so that you're running instructions of like what the player colors are going to be and what it's going to look like right before the laser beam is there and starts drawing the, the, the player and all that. So, yeah. So that that is the biggest kind of main difference between like uh, 2600 dev and modern, you know, engine based, you know, uh, game dev, I suppose. Um, right. You're programming for 
the next second, the next millisecond on the screen rather than program for the next frame all at once. Yeah, exactly. And yeah, the analogy I've been kind of throwing out is like you're building a race you're building a racetrack while the cars are going and then <laughs> yes and then yeah. i've to, heard the train a train analogy as well you're laying down the track as the train <laughs> is running exactly yeah it's the same analogy exactly yeah. yeah um yeah you're building the racetrack and then you have to build it every single lap you know you have to keep building it <laughs> over right. and over again uh but yeah, somebody destroyed my racetrack oh my god <laughs> uh uh, but then the other big thing, the other main difference, and it's not really a difference, but it's just the uh, a scale, you know, the scale of resources you have, you know, is on the 2600 is beyond meager, you know, where <laughs> where we yeah. we are yeah. talking about individual bytes. We're talking about 128 bytes of RAM, you know, uh, yeah. which yeah. is from a modern context. It is so I broke it down. I used to give. Uh, there's a, a college, a, lo a college by me. I used to, you know, my boss is actually a teacher there and he would have me go in and kind of talk about how the 2600 works. Cause he would teach this game design history Land class. And, or, uh, um, so I, I broke it down at one point because, you know, there's like, like individual numbers on modern systems take up multiple bytes. So I broke it down. I forget how many it is <laughs> yeah. now, but you could store like, you know, 32 just numbers, uh, like modern <laughs> numbers on 128 bytes of RAM or something. Uh, so it, it's like an infinitesimally small amount, right? It's just like a completely negligible amount. Like, you know, you wouldn't even... It's, it's a rounding about. error. Exactly. <laughs> totally, right? Like, it's, it's, yeah, totally. Um, and then the ROM uh, size, you know, you're talking about your standard ROM chip is four kilobytes, which uh, I, I, I yeah. would say I would... On my presentations, I would have like a JPEG of an Atari cartridge, and I'm like, this wouldn't fit on an Atari cartridge. This image, like, this image is like four times too big. Like, you couldn't do it. Um, yeah. And then, yeah, what's interesting about having such limited ROM is that you can write too much code, which it was a uh, mm. really crazy thing to yeah. kind of get into as a programmer, where like, you know, nowadays, like, you know, games are massive, right? Like a modern video game is huge, um, you know, uh, where it's like, you know, hundreds of gigs or whatever it is. And but that's all yeah. like resources. That's all audio. That's textures. That's models. That's, you know, just like these big art assets. The code is, you know, you don't even think about it. It's not even a consideration. You can write, you know, you can you can write. You can have a million programmers writing a million lines of code, and you wouldn't even really need to worry about the <laughs> about the size of your program code. Um, yeah, because it just wouldn't matter. Like you know, Blu-ray discs are huge, and you know, we're we could uh, internet bandwidth is enormous, and we can just you know, it, it's yeah. just There's huge terabyte hard drives in modern consoles. Exactly, yeah. hard drives are huge. It's, it's like pretty much unlimited, really. Like more or less, right? Um, yeah. But then when you get into the 2600 and you're and you're suddenly like, OK, like when you suddenly have to count like, oh, whoops, like <laughs> I, I wrote uh, eight bytes too many, you know, too much code and I'm overflowing <laughs> now. And uh, and that yeah, and that that's sometimes like sometimes it's not obvious or sometimes it's like it could be hard. It, that could be a, like a really difficult like debugging step where suddenly your thing isn't compiling and it's like, OK. I think I overflowed at some point, but I don't know exactly by how much. And okay, yeah. well, how do I? You either have to like strip a bunch of stuff out, or you you magic up a way to optimize it, right? And be like, yeah, exactly. Yeah, you only have one sixtieth of a second before it starts drawing the screen again, mm -hmm. and you have to fit all the code to draw that screen before that screen starts drawing again. It's it's a big race. It's a yeah. constant race. Yeah. And you don't have much time while it's drawing the screen. Mm -hmm. Most of the calculations are done when it's not drawing the screen, which is like 30% of the screen real estate or something. The over scan. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I, forget, uh, uh, I forget how many scan lines. President McHammergill has a question. What's the address space of a 2600 cartridge port? Um, I believe it's 4K at a time they're able to address and you need to... Um, 
you change a uh, bank switch mm -hmm. into another 4k yeah yeah nope, yeah definitely. Elifer answered it yeah um so did any of i'm sure it does uh any of your modern day programming for modern consoles translate and help you programming the 2600 game and what was like the most translatable i guess um uh, things that you've learned from modern programming that would translate into the 2600 game that's a good question i think because a lot of modern programming is like kind of reckoning with the fact that you can kind of write unlimited code um <laughs> more or less so it's like okay yeah. yeah we we're writing programs that are millions of lines or whatever um now it's kind of a logistics nightmare of like okay if we have like 20 developers on this application you know how are people how are people growing the code how are we debugging it how are we organizing everything so that's kind of a lot of what modern programming is is kind of dealing with these kind of meta structures and and class diagrams and you know uh, you know how how are we you know uh, uh, compartmentalizing data and how are we encapsulating things so that you know we we don't hurt ourselves when we you know suddenly start <laughs> messing with you know this class that no one's touched in like six years or whatever uh, yeah, so yeah. Uh, like honestly like you know it's like it's kind of like going back to basics in a lot of ways where, you know, when you start out in kind of a programming class, you know, you, you learn a couple thing, uh, key things, right? You learn here are variables, here are if statements, here's a loop, you know, here's a function, go nuts. Like let's write some simple programs. Right. And so a lot of it is, you know, once you, uh, you do have to kind of memorize the assembly language, which is very different from, you know, a modern, you know, human readable, uh, high level language, like a C plus plus or whatever. But once you kind of do that, yeah. then you're kind of going back to basics and then, and then, yeah, then it's just kind of a game of optimization where you are like, okay, I wrote this thing in, you know, 12 instructions. Can I compress it down into three instructions, you know? Uh, yeah. and, and that was my next question is about um, had you programmed in assembly before or was this your first foray into programming in assembly? Th this was my first foray, you know, I had, yeah, I think a lot of like computer science programs will get you writing some assembly code, maybe, mm. but I, I didn't take a traditional yeah. <laughs> computer science course. I, you know, I took that game specific course like I was describing at the beginning. Right. Uh, so which, they would focus on modern languages and modern infrastructure for, you know, modern systems. Yeah, yeah, they were they were kind of all about like getting into, yeah, kind of the down and dirty, like here's we're we're going straight to C plus plus, and then hey we're going straight to Unity, you know, 3D, and you know we're doing C sharp and all that kind of good right. stuff. Um, so so yeah, part of my you know college, um, I guess education was uh, I did skip I guess a lot of like that like really foundational stuff of computer science, right. and and then the years after that I kind of went back and learned a lot of that stuff just on my own time. But uh, uh, but uh, but yeah, so yeah, it, that was kind of the first time, and it was it was kind of exciting, you know, when you get into assembly code, mm -hmm. it is very. It is very puzzly, which I appreciate, you know, and you are yeah. really like piecing together these very simple blocks into, you know, into functioning code. But then, yeah, like that game of optimization of like, OK, yeah, like, ooh, like there's that that cheap thrill of of like, ooh, like I can actually do this in only six instructions instead of the, you know, <laughs> this huge block that I was doing before, like, oh, like, and it really gets the juices flowing. <laughs> yeah, it, it is, it is much like a puzzle. Like it's how do I get this game to do this in the simplest way possible or the most elegant way possible. Yeah, and, definitely. And just managing it all, yeah. So so let's, let's go back in time uh, to um february 2016 february 10th where uh on twitter you said uh i'm about to start my first ever stream i'll be making an atari 2600 game oh, man. you can watch here so that you you streamed um in 2000 early 2016 to mid 2016 on twitch you developing a game uh unfortunately 
all the Twitch videos are gone and all the YouTube archives of these Twitch videos are <laughs> gone or deleted. Um, so I wasn't able to check them out. I think that would have been very interesting. Um, I'm glad they're so gone. What... Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, so what state was the game at when you finished, say, your Twitch development streams mid-2016? And then how did it progress from there to the kind of finished 2600 game? Um, yeah, I, let's see, I, I was doing that for a little while, man. Yeah. It, it's been, I know it's seven years ago. It's, it's, <laughs> it's a while back. Yeah. Uh, so I, I want to say at uh, like when I was doing that, I got it. Yeah. I mean, it, it was early, right? It was early in the development. Uh, so I would have been making kind of that base, uh, like, that level creation framework that I was kind of describing, you know, with the like yeah. eight by six blocks and, and, and some of that. And I think I was getting the player, you know, or the, the, the Mr. Run and jump himself, the character, I think I got him in there and I got, I got it. So when you move to the edge of the screen, it, it flips over to the next screen. And it was, so right. it, yeah, when I was streaming, I was kind of doing that really foundational stuff. Um, oh. And, and I, it was called Jump and Run at that point. It it was. <laughs> Man, you you did your homework, huh? <laughs> uh, you got it. You got to do your homework. <laughs> Get yeah. the good questions. Uh, yeah. I called it yeah, Jump and Run for a long time. Um uh, kind of a play on run and jump. You know, how, how yeah. people would describe platformers as like a run and jump game. I kind of had like this yep. fantasy where uh the game I was making was almost like the proto platformer that like you know, someone would be like, oh, you know, everyone looks at Super Mario as like the first platformer. But actually, uh, did you okay. know that, you know, there was this other one on the 2600 that kind of does a lot of the same stuff. And this is where, right. you know, platforming really comes from. And it's like, you know, that, that was An like alternate the fantasy universe in my missing head. link. Yeah. Alternate universe missing link game on the 2600 that somebody exactly. found out that existed but never got released or something. <laughs> exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. 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 And in that alternate universe, it's it's called a jump and run game instead of a run and jump game. And so, so that, <laughs> ah, okay. that, that's why that's why I, I was calling it that. But um, uh, eventually, yeah. So, so you're asking kind of like... Um, I would stream. Just, just what state? What did it, it was? It? Yeah, tell us about the streaming and what you did on it a bit. Well, the streams were like dreadfully boring, right? Like, you know, <laughs> I didn't know what I was doing. Because uh, you were learning at the same time how to do things. It wasn't just straight up. I know what I'm doing. Here's me coding it. It was like I'm learning and coding. Exactly. Yeah. So it was a lot of me. Like I had, I had learned assembly language and I had done some like basic, you know, developing a kernel or something and just getting, you know, something up and running on the 2600. Um, so, excuse me. Uh, it was a lot of. It was a lot of me just like sitting there and staring at the screen and being like, uh, <laughs> like, you know, just like not able to fill the air. And then I would write a couple right. things and be like, no, that didn't do anything. And, and so uh, <laughs> still a blank screen. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, and so what I, I would, what I would try to do is like maybe I was doing at the start or at the end of the streams, but I would try to like break out like photoshop and kind of draw for people be like okay here's what i'm do i'm trying to do like here's my screen here's you know i'm trying to like divide up the screen into these you know chunks like this and kind of just do some like you know raw kind of like you know just doodling just to kind of help illustrate for people but i mean it was right yeah. no one was watching right so <laughs> there was there was never more than like no a person you know uh <laughs> yeah jumping in and out yeah yeah definitely uh so uh but yeah so i, I did that for a little while and then i'm like it, it was a side project right and I, I wasn't super consistent with it so it was something that i would kind of put down for a long time and then pick up for like another three months and kind of work on it really hard and be like ooh, like let me you know, let me do a little more run and jump uh, yeah. and then put it down for a little while. And then so it, it was kind of like that for years, I want to say, you know. OK, OK. It, it was like that for 
uh, until maybe yeah like uh, i, I want to say maybe around like 2019 i had the game like mostly there like mostly done okay um okay. and uh and then around that time, yeah, I started looking at like, okay, what am I going to do with this thing? And I came to like, well, I can, I, I can, you know, bundle it with, uh, with Stella, the emulator, and I can make kind of a shell app to kind of have the whole thing. And then right. maybe I could take that whole thing and sell it on Steam. Um, and that was going right. to be my plan, you know, and I'm like, yeah, well, let's just get this thing done. Let's just get it out here so I don't have to keep thinking about it and revisiting it for you know a couple months out of the year or whatever and uh but uh it was around that time we were looking or uh you know graphite lab my day job was uh talking more and more with atari uh right where that relationship was kind of just happenstance right like like we right you know i, I described we were doing mobile games for a long time and uh, one of those games, we, I guess out of some just old relationship like my boss had with someone who was now working in Atari, uh, we got to work on Roller Coaster Tycoon Puzzle, which was okay. uh, Roller Coaster Tycoon licensed match three puzzle game. Uh, mm -hmm. And that was on iOS and Android devices. And that was kind of our first big project with Atari. Um, so we kind of supported that with them for a long time. And then, uh, yeah, like it was, I guess it was two years ago now, but we, we, uh, someone at this, at Graphite Lab, um, Phil Snowbarger, uh, uh, developed kind of this, uh, uh, a game jam game, which, uh, game jam is like, you have like 48 hours and put together a, a prototype or a game or something. Um, yeah. And that wound up being the seed for a game we made for Atari called Combinera, uh, which we put out last year. That is a uh, like a puzzle platformer where it's like, yeah, you got like a single screen of kind of level geometry and there's like all these circles around the screen. And as you move, like they all move. And so like the point mm -hmm. is to kind of like jump them around and move them so that they combine together. And once you get all the circles together, uh, okay. you know, they, they combine and then that's, you know, that's the puzzle and that's the end of the level. Nice. Uh, so we, uh, yeah, so that, that was us, um, kind of getting back into making console games. Cause we pitched this as like, Hey, we want to bring this to, you know, it did wind up coming out on mobile as well, but, um, it, it came out on switch and Xbox and PlayStation and, uh, the VCS and everything. And that, yep. that was kind of the, you know, looking at that, and then we had this relationship with Atari, and then I just kind of happened to be working on, you know, the 2600 game from, you know, way back, and it's like, you know, I, I guess I, I saw the path forward, right? It's like, I'm like, okay, <laughs> like, what if, yeah. what if we took what I'm doing here, and then we, you know, give it kind of, because Common Air uses the same kind of neon glowy art style that new run and jump has like the modern version so i'm like okay i, I did yeah. recognize some some crossover in in look and design between the two games when i saw that other game yeah yeah definitely yeah and and so it was like okay we can combine common era with run and jump and we can make kind of a modern new platformer with it and we, and we used that and we kind of pitched that to atari and and we had the 2600 game as kind of the you know the prototype you know kind of proof of concept i guess and they loved it like they played the 2600 game they yeah. really loved it uh yeah and that that kind of sold them on it and and so then it became a thing of like okay well atari's interested in this thing now i i'm not going to put it out you know i'm because because part of it is like okay now atari is going to kind of take control of mr run and jump and kind of do their right. thing with it um but uh, but yeah, so we we kind of gave them the classic version, and and in the meantime, we developed a, the new version, and then yeah, that was kind of our our big pitch was like, okay, you'll have the classic one, and we'll have this new one, and right, and and yeah, they'll they'll kind of together they'll kind of tell the the whole story of Mr. Run and Jump, you know, and right, and they've got that cross promotion between the the old school and the new school, which you know Atari is trying to bridge the two together and to bring over 
you know, people, fans from the classic 2600 to bring them to the Atari VCS and yeah. bring that nostalgia feeling. You know, they're doing all the reimagined games and things like that. Mm. So it, it would be a natural combination, almost uh, packaged together. The, the cartridge old school 2600 and the new Mr. Run and Jump reimagined yeah. future version. Yeah, definitely. It is almost like we did one of their recharge titles, but the game didn't exist yes. yet, you know? It's like, <laughs> that's right. We made Just the like game. what you were saying before, it was like this game that that never came out, and now <laughs> it's being updated from 1981, you know, it came out. Yeah. Right, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Um, so going back a little bit again, um, October 2016, you gave a talk on the Atari 2600 programming at Pixel Pop Fest hmm. and also presented your game for people to play it there. Hmm. Uh, it looked like it was running on uh, an Atari, a four port Atari 5200 with a, a 2600 adapter. Funny yeah. enough, that's like the craziest thing you could run it on. <laughs> but um, <laughs> um, do, you, do you remember what the reception was like? Um, I mean, it's go way back to to the platformer, to the game that you uh, showed off there. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, Pixel Pop is it's a local show uh, or it was a local show. We haven't yeah. it hasn't gone on uh, since COVID. Uh, COVID yeah. kind of shut it down and hasn't really come back. But uh, it was something like Graphite Lab would go to. We would show Hive Jump, uh, the game you know I, I was describing uh, earlier. But uh, uh, but then I'm like, well, you know, I, I can go and I could show you know this you know jump and run thing I was working on, and uh, uh, it was uh, it's a pretty low key show. You know, this one especially they like changed locations and it was it, it was kind of a weird situation. But so not like a ton of people were there, but uh, the people that did show up, you know. Uh, uh, did get a kick out of it. Like, you know, it, people see it and people, you know, I, I remember one guy like looked at it and he's like, I know what this is. And I'm like, <laughs> like, do you? Because I made this. <laughs> like, uh, I've seen this before. Uh, no, but, you haven't. <laughs> but he's like, he, he thought it was E.T. He thought I would just set up like a, oh. he thought I oh, set up funny. like an E.T. booth for people to come and play. And I'm like, no, no, I made this. Like, you know, it's called Jump and Run. Like, check it out. Um, yeah. but yeah, it would be, you know, you show it at a game like, or at a show like pixel pop and there's a lot of like parents walking around with their kids and, and that's always kind of a sweet moment because you get the mm. parents will take like their young kids who are playing like Nintendo switch or whatever they were playing Wii U at the time, I guess. Uh, but, <laughs> yeah. uh, but they come and they're like, Oh, here, you know, Hey, play this. This is what, you know, this is what your mom and me had to play, you know, when we were your age and, <laughs> um, and it's it's funny to see like young kids like really get into it, you know. We like I would have, you know, like young kids like stay there for you know, uh, I don't know how long. It probably wasn't like an hour, but it was like you know twenty minutes yeah. or whatever, you know, longer than you'd think like a kid would. You know, I, there's a lot of hay made about like attention spans and all that stuff, and it's like <laughs> no, I mean this kid is here yeah. like glued to the screen. He really wants yeah. to get to Yellow World, whatever, you know. <laughs> yeah, and that's the great thing about homebrew is that um, you bring the modern, like some modern sensibilities to an older system so that, you know, maybe some younger people can associate with the game a bit better than some of the older games that are a bit more, you know, obtuse and obscure abstract. and like abstract. <laughs> and it's yeah. like, what, what is going on in this game? It's like, no, this one is like your game is very straightforward. You run and you jump <laughs> and you avoid bad things. So somebody like a young kid would be able to pick it up and go, I understand this. I'm running to the right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah absolutely. Especially when the controller has the one button, you know, you don't have to like, walk them through like, okay, here you hit this button at the bottom. And then when you're in the air, you hit this other button. And, you know, just... Yeah. No tutorial needed. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. You know, they can, they can pick it up and they can, they can feel it out, you know? Um, but it is, you know, uh, kind of what you're describing is something I uh, consciously tried to build into the game where I feel like modern games are much better about this than like old 2600 games where you had to like read a manual yeah. in order to really kind of know how to play a more complicated game. Uh, where it's like yeah, because a lot game. of them use the diff difficulty switches and the black and white switch and you have to do reset and select which game 
and now you know modern homebrews usually have a maybe have a menu on the screen or it just goes right into the game <laughs> and uh yeah it's not as not as weird and fiddly. you don't fiddly and you don't <laughs> necessarily have to read the manual for some for some more complicated ones you do but yeah, yeah. it's just one button <laughs> yeah for sure but just the even like the construction of like the first world and run and jump, you know, the the blue world, you know, is very deliberately laid out to be like, OK, here's here's one jump, you know, here that you make. And yeah. it's there's there's nothing dangerous about it. You just but you have to make this one jump in order to progress. And that kind of teaches you, OK, I, like it teaches you the very <laughs> foundational basic mechanics of like, OK, here's one jump. Okay, now here's two yeah. jumps you got to do. Okay, now here's like a really <laughs> yes. long jump you got to do. Okay, now here's danger. Yeah. Here's one spike. Doesn't move. Yeah. Jump over. You know, just that very deliberate, slow kind of walking you through just the very yeah. foundations that, of the game it is kind that's of like great a great game design. And 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 I I'm, I'm it's reminiscent of a talk I heard about uh, the Super Mario Brothers as well. And I, I think you might be kind of in referencing that and how Mario was laid out it's like okay you're on the screen you're by yourself there's no danger here comes one obstacle you die or you hit it yes exactly yeah, it's yep. very very smart it's a built-in tutorial that you've, mm -hmm. you've made yeah yeah absolutely um so when you started looking into programming for the atari 2600 what resources did you use to learn about the system and programming did you visit the atari age forums did you get download some books on uh programming or um did you get some tips and tricks from the atari age forum uh, for your development uh atari age forums was definitely kind of the launching off point um there okay. is um you know i i don't i don't go on there religiously so you know uh and it's been a while since I've I've looked at some of those resources, but but yeah, uh, there was definitely like here's a thread and here's like hey if you're getting into homebrew like start here, um, and someone mm -hmm. someone you know put together like or it's like here's uh, here's the linker or or here's the compiler you know and here's how you work it you know uh, feed your ROM into this and then uh, you know it's going to spit out a binary. Uh, yeah. He, here's a breakdown of the assembly language that the 6502 processor uses. Um, you know, that that was really wonderful. That was a great resource. Um, and then someone linked the old, like, original Stella manual, which, yeah. you know, talked about, like, all the, uh, the registers and, you know, just all the things that the console was technically capable of. Uh, so I, I I wound up referencing that a lot, which surprised me. Like I I thought like the original manual would maybe be like above my head or, you know, yeah. too, too like uh, archaic maybe is the word I'm looking for. But just like you know, it's it's pretty good actually. It's surprisingly good for I think it was written in seventy nine, a couple of years after the twenty six hundred came out. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. it's quite readable. Quite good. Um, yeah. still usable today uh <laughs> and uh and that was kind of uh yeah that that was kind of you know once i kind of once you kind of have those foundation blocks you know once you can kind of compile code and you know how to write assembly and you know you know yep. kind of how to structure it like how to make a kernel and and things like that and 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 how to mess with like registers and stuff like that on the console itself you know you're you're in a good spot and you can you know kind of go off to the races and and i think from there you know occasionally like bugs would come up or or i had to look up like other things on those forums for like when it turns out i needed bank switching and you know uh, more complicated right. things like that um but uh but otherwise that was kind of that was kind of the the long and short of it you know i didn't want to you know, I I didn't want to like I, I saw there was like uh, like a basic compiler, you know, the like the basic programming language. Right. Like, oh, he, yeah. If you want to use like a high level language or a high ish level language, use this. And and I'm like, eh, I kind of ignored that. Like I kind of wanted the the true experience. Right. Like I, <laughs> the hardcore experience. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, 
And then in that in the spirit of that, I kind of didn't want to look up any like, you know, uh, like common techniques or, you know, if uh, okay. like, you know, he, like I really wanted to feel it out for myself um, and, okay. and make I, your own mistakes going along. And yeah, 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 definitely. Um, yeah, I didn't want to just copy someone else, like whatever someone else was doing. Like, you know, I, I, I wanted to get in there and figure it out. You know, that was kind of my goal. Yeah. Um, so when did you realize that your game, Mr. Run and Jump, would be the first new original game to be released on cartridge by Atari in 33 years? <laughs> and what did you think of that designation? Can you talk about how it came to be that Atari decided that it's your game, your specific <laughs> game, that would be the first new game to be, re be released on cartridge? <sighs> yeah, I... Uh... I forget the timeline exactly like when we kind of knew that this is what they were going to do. Cause I, like, you know, when, you know, when the, I guess modern game kind of, you know, came to be and we were into development on that, you know, that was kind of the question is like, okay, like what are we doing with the classic game? And it's like, uh, do we have to, do we have to like make you know are we going to put it out digitally do we have to make like right. some kind of you know shell app for it kind of like i was planning you know when i was going to put it out right. myself like i mentioned earlier but um and i forget exactly when kind of these decisions were made but i want to say it was it was decently early on when we were making mm. the new mr run and jump that we kind of like we didn't even really know like it wasn't something we paid too close attention to that you know atari had this xp program you know uh where they're yeah. putting out like saboteur 2 and uh i forget what else uh, yeah i want to say maybe they had launched that like maybe they were unless i'm making that up i you know i <laughs> Right. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you probably don't know, don't know the exact timing, but it was more in it was it more in their hands, I guess. It was when hand, when yeah. each things would be released. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, they they kind of had total control of it. Um yeah, it, it wasn't uh we we certainly didn't come up to them and say like, hey, "We want to like put this out on cartridge" cuz uh, like it's insane, <laughs> right? Like, you know, I'm like that's yeah, like something might be some like... of the games are being released. Some of the games are being released through the Atari VCS, like John Van Risen's new hero sequel of sorts <laughs> is it was put out digitally only, and uh, it may get a cartridge. We don't know. And yours wasn't put out digitally, but it did get a cartridge. So I, it's just kind of random uh, decisions that they've made, I guess. Not random. They know what they're doing. But <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's gonna it's gonna do. I mean, yeah. What what exactly they, what exactly they do with it? I mean, it's it's up to them. Like we we only have so much insight into what Atari is thinking at any given any given point, right? <laughs> yeah. But but yeah, like we we thought like okay, like we obviously we want to put out the classic thing like i i was kind of pulling for like oh let's do a digital thing we were talking like right. oh it'd be cool if we like bundled this together or like you know you buy right you buy right. one you can get both or 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 you like the classic could be like a pre-order bonus or something or you know right. all all kinds of stuff like that um and then yeah eventually they I want to say, yeah, it was while we were doing Run and Jump Classic that they kind of launched the their XP program, and mm. you know they were putting out. I forget what the games were, but aside from like Saboteur Two, but right. But, I mean, they did the a full run of, or they are doing a full run of ten classic games repackaged in nice light up lit up cartridges and stuff. So that's part of the cartridge lineup. Yeah, and then some unreleased games like saboteur putting it on cartridge that were made back in the day but never got released right yeah, yeah. and 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 yours is the first new game that has never been released mm -hmm. put on cartridge yeah yeah and i think uh i think it is just a factor of like you know we you know um you know uh run and jump i guess belongs to atari now right like 
like right. part of, you know, us making the game was we had to, you know, it's it's their property now. It's I believe, you know, they hold the IP rights, but, you know, so. Yeah, because I looked on the cartridge at the bottom, it says, you know, copyright Atari. And yeah, yeah. Any of the other names that uh, you work for and, you know, Heavy Horse and yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, uh, that that's i guess kind of the the key thing is like you know the, here's the thing that they now own they got the new thing coming out so it is kind of that like cross promo thing where one can kind of feed in marketing to the other um so yeah like uh cuz yeah i've seen a couple uh you know uh, looking at people be like oh like yeah why mr run and jump like there's all kinds of like great home <laughs> stuff coming out and it's like it's like I, yeah I, I feel you man you know it's like you know like i say it it, it wasn't you know it, it isn't a factor I mean, you're not you're not going to complain about your game being put out obviously no no <laughs> you're like no no not. don't put out my game please yeah no absolutely it, it's not a factor of like oh my game's way better than yours or you know whatever it's yeah. it's it it's just kind of the happenstance it's just kind of you know I, I like to say the, the the stars aligned for Mr. Run and Jump. You know, I I happen to be working for a company that happened to be working for Atari, and you know, all the things kind of lined up in such a way that just made you know Mr. Run and Jump kind of the 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 you know here's kind of the ROM that they have, and here's kind of you know this just kind of happens to be the one that made it to be like the first new uh, you know cartridge game, you know, but. Yeah. But yeah, not not to denigrate, you know, myself either. Like I think, you know, uh, <laughs> yeah. I I, th I think there's certainly a, a lot of charm to Mr. Run and Jump, and and Atari, you know, has certainly liked it. You know, they they've come back to me and they're like, we got guys, you know, we've got like engineers in the back who love it, and they they're doing like, you know, <laughs> they have like you know score contests going, and they're oh, they're like uh, obsessed with nice. it. Like, uh, yeah. So. And it is very nice how you did the score counting down so that you know you it's because some other developers do that as well vhzc for example hmm. um so it's a built-in score and timer at the same time it's a dual purpose which really is very useful for speed runs for example yeah definitely yeah it was a thing where i got some feedback uh actually from atari age uh i showed it to someone there uh yeah. trying to get on the atari age store like way back yeah probably around like that 2016 time um okay yeah and i showed them the game and i'm like hey what do you think and they're like me <laughs> you know they're like because uh, <laughs> at the time like the the game wasn't quite as fully featured as it is right like you know i had kind of right. those basics in but uh didn't have the score leap wasn't a thing I didn't have like the title oh, okay. menu. I don't think the enemies like the game didn't even have sound, right? Like it, it was very, <laughs> very basic. early. Yeah. yeah. And they're like, uh, you know, I mean, you got a good start here. What if you did like X, Y, Z? What? If, it's not very replayable. Why don't you add, you know, some kind of scoring system? Um, yeah. And so I, I kind of took that as, as feedback. I'm like, all right. Like, yeah, like a score could be good, but like there's not really like scorable actions in the game necessarily. Uh, there's nothing right. you're picking it's... up. You're not like fighting enemies. Uh, yeah. There's not like a thing you're going to get rewarded points for. So, right, right. you know, that, that was kind of the, the thought that kind of spurred on the, you know, here you have your max score and then it ticks down over time. And then it's like, Oh yeah, it's kind of like a speed run thing. Um, yeah. Yeah. So that, that was kind of the genesis of that. Mm. Um, so we're going to get into a, a bit of a technical aspects, not not too deep, but um, sure. some of the developers on the Atari Age forums have some questions about uh, the screen stability. Um, in John Hancock's video of the gameplay he posted a week ago, he noted some instability when the character moves from screen to screen. Um, do you know if he was playing the final cartridge version of the game um, on his stream? And and I think you mentioned that your your testing equipment was an Atari hooked up to a CRT. Um, did you? I guess you didn't hook it up to a like an else a modern television or anything, because CRTs are notoriously really good at handling <laughs> issues. Let's say with with output. Yeah, I so I've seen that footage, and I don't know where that came from. 
Um, as I, because whenever I play it, I play it. Yeah, it's it is it, it's it's a modern TV. But I think it. I I don't know exactly what TV type I'm running. Like it's not like a big fat right. like old CRT, but it's not like an LCD either. I I so I want to say it's okay. some kind of uh, CRT. Whenever I play it, it, yep. it runs perfectly. As okay, uh, whether it's on the emulator or when I run it, you know, put it on the Harmony cart and I run it on my actual console hooked up to my little CRT. Um, okay. So I and I. And I mean, you you can see in the footage that you showed earlier, like you know, it's not supposed to like go crazy with the screen like Flip that. Out. So <laughs> yeah, so yeah. I I really don't know what is up with that. You know, it, this was kind of a thing. Like I gave Atari the ROM, and they you know they put it on the cartridges, and they are handling they it from it there. Yeah, yeah, and I I haven't seen it kind of in its final form in that way. So I, you know, I'm I'm sitting here. I'm I'm hoping they, you know, that everything is running okay. I, I hope it's not something with like, you know, uh, uh, John Hancock uh, with his like uh, capture setup or something. Like, uh, but I, yeah, honestly, I, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, we'll, we'll find out eventually. But <laughs> as people tear it apart when it when it comes out, yeah, um, um, yeah. So it it all depends on you know what screens you're using, what systems you're using. I think he was running it through a RetroTINK 5X, which I mm. have as well, hmm. and because I can see the title screen flash for a second um, when it changes from screen to screen which means it had that in its buffer, which is the first screen. But anyway, mm. um, it's probably a scan line count issue. It's going away from 262 scan lines to 263 or some other random number. But uh, we'll see. We'll see what happens. Yeah, yeah, I'm not sure. Um, but yeah, I've never tested it on a, on a retro thing. I haven't tested it really on anything besides like my actual uh, uh, console so yeah. yeah, we'll 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 kind of see, but yeah, <laughs> on, on some yeah. level, I'm I'm just as clueless as you are, uh, or in, <laughs> in terms yeah. of like you know what Atari, what kind of carts they're using, or or you know kind yeah. of wide accessibility of of the thing. Yeah. Um, another another question from the developers. I you kind of answered this earlier, um, based on how you built the game, um, from building blocks. Um, the, some of the developers also noticed um, some flicker in the player characters. I mean, that is obviously done intentionally because you have your character, which is steady, drawn every frame, mm -hmm. and then you have the enemies, which are sharing the screen mm -hmm. um, as the second player character, because a lot of people that are watching, or if you don't know, that you only have two. You only have two players mm -hmm. to draw all your things. There's like extra stuff as well, but the big, powerful, you know, eight-bit wide uh, things. You only get two of them. Mm -hmm. So you kept one as the player character and one as the enemies. Mm -hmm. um, but as more enemies are added or more obstacles are added, um, you increase the um, the sharing of the second player to 30 hertz then 20 hertz, one every two frames, one every three frames. Mm -hmm. um, so you probably didn't get into advanced programming technique of um, flicker management. So when they're not on the same line, you know, you can just draw it again. You just went, because they're moving all over the screen, you're just like, okay, I'm not going to worry about where they are on the screen. Just draw them every third frame or every second frame mm -hmm. that's what i'm guessing yeah yeah definitely yeah it is it is uh, like i like i was talking about with trade-offs earlier like it was just come mm -hmm. kind of something i i decided early on of like of like well you know i'm okay with the flicker if it lets me a lot more easily uh have this kind of like any enemy can be anywhere you know that's what paradigm I right yeah. like um, so yeah, it, it was purely the, the flicker purely is something out of, yeah, like that, that desire for like total freedom of, uh, uh, level flexibility design. Flexibility to, 
flexibility to put any enemy anywhere, I'm guessing. Exactly. Like yeah. you're saying you're saying before, put an enemy there, move it in this range up and down or mm -hmm. side to side, and then you know, I, I'm guessing you're just counting. Is there three enemies? Okay. Every third frame, every third frame. Exactly. Yep. Yeah, it's ex exactly okay. that. I render one enemy a frame, and then they, they just kind of go in sequence like that. So one frame, render one enemy. Next frame, render the next one. Next frame, render the next one. So so I never I never get past, like, I think the most is, like, five enemies, right? Like. Oh, and, boy. <laughs> wow. Yeah. And then uh, and then after that, I'm like, okay, this the flicker is unbearable, right? But. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But, uh, but yeah. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, it, it, a thing yeah where if the if the screens were a little more static or or if I had like a more like confined plan of like what you know each screen was kind of going to be look like, um, right. then yeah there, there's lots of tricks you can do to like squeeze in like you know multiple enemies on the same thing so that they don't flicker. But um, yeah, you went for flexibility in screen planning. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. Um. So it, I thought it was a really fun addition you did on the modern Mr. Run and Jump from the transition from the 2600 graphics to the more modern graphics as a nod to the game's origins. Yeah. So how much of the how much of the um, 2600 game design tra um, traversed into the more modern version of Mr. Run and Jump, like in terms of levels, enemies, etc.? Sure. Uh, yeah, it's uh, like that was kind of our main inspiration. You know, uh, we as we talk about the modern Mr. Run and Jump, we talk about games like, you know, like like a modern precision uh, precision platformer like a Celeste or Super Meat Boy or stuff like that. But really, yeah. those were kind of like post hoc kind of like, oh, yeah, these are this game kind of wound up like these other games, but, but really it was a desire to capture that original Mr. Run and Jump is kind of uh, like why the modern version is the way it is, you know? So in terms of like what carried over, you know, uh, it was kind of the one hit, one hit deaths and like the rapid reloads. Uh, it was uh, all the enemies from the classic version made it over into the new version uh, it was the character. Uh, every level in the new version starts with a uh, leap running out of a portal uh, and then kind of nice. darts away. And that that mimics just like we saw with the footage, uh, uh, you know, when you uh, go to a new world in the classic game, you see leap kind of running off. And uh, and yeah, so we we pitched uh, the new version of Mr. Run and Jump as a sequel to the classic one, which is kind of why it opens the way it does, where, yeah, that like the classic segment of the new run and jump is as close a facsimile as I could make uh, of how the 2600, how the classic version works. Uh, so I, I got rid of the flickering because, you know, just to, <laughs> didn't, didn't want to bring that over. Didn't want to bring it over. <laughs> and then I uh, it, there's some shortcuts with like collision and stuff like that. But then and then. Um, right. Oh, uh, oh uh, when you respawn in the classic version, you respawn at the beginning of uh, of the, the color world you're in. So if you're in the green world, you start you die and you respawn at the beginning of the green world. This one, you just respawn right. at the last room you were in. So uh, we found right. people even more modern sensibilities. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, definitely. We, we found like when we we're in the modern version, like people had a lot of trouble actually with the classic version like you know we would we would like set right. up the game for like play testing and then it's like okay like we figure like okay people you know the classic version you know the little prologue is so simple like people just blow through it in like a couple minutes and then we're good but when they had to like restart all the way back to the beginning people actually had like kind of a lot of trouble you know getting through that part so we're like we're like uh you know throwing controllers <laughs> raging ah, <laughs> they put me back here ah. it was so so we're like ah let's just let's just make this little concession and just you get them to you know get them to the game right like quote unquote yeah you know, the actual game um but yeah so uh other than that you know uh you know, the new run and jump uh, obviously expands like the move set, but, you know, kind of the, the same yeah. basic premise, you know, is still there. You know, you're still kind of an abstract little platforming dude and kind of an abstract platforming land. And 
Uh, you run yeah. and you jump, and uh, <laughs> there are no ladders in the new version, which the original has ladders okay. that you can climb. So that's something that the original oh, no. has that the new one doesn't. It's a, it's a downgrade. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. Um, so do you think you'll continue on creating more, like you kind of touched on this, more 2600 games? Or are you like, okay, I've conquered the 2600 time to move on to the the next era which is the nes um and do you have any and do you have any ideas for those games right now do you have like a binder full of them or you know uh at this time i don't have any plans to make uh any more homebrew right now um at least at this yeah. at this time i may, maybe something in the future but i kind of have another project in mind it's going to be my next thing uh mm -hmm. but uh uh, and then, yeah, in terms of like ideas for like, you know, I, I mean, I still think about those ideas I had for, uh, Nintendo, like an NES game here. One, yeah. I probably won't wind up doing, I kind of a thought of doing like a Castlevania like game where you were kind of like a okay. side scrolling, you know, uh, and, but instead of a whip, you had like a fishing rod and <laughs> the idea is you would go to different levels and you would like you would maybe have like a zelda style like menu you could bring down and like equip different bait and different rods and de <laughs> depending nice. on like where you were like which like what level you're in you uh. could like cast your rod into you know a, a body of water like a lake or something and catch fish that way and, and depending on like yep. the the rod and where you were and the bait and all that stuff would depend on what fish you're getting and then you would use the fish as your weapons they would be like your whip in a castlevania game so you'd, you would mm. be like catching your weapons mm. you know you'd have these fish and then you'd like beat up you know enemies with them uh, and then advance <laughs> through the game that way uh that's that's crazy that's funny yeah <laughs> so that that was one thing i'm cooking up you know I, and i don't know nearly yeah. enough about what it takes to make an nes game so i don't know if that's reasonably viable but you know that <laughs> kind of my thought process was like you know taking you know stitching together parts of games you know like i mentioned castlevania with a zelda menu uh right yeah. so i'm like well but it, those games do both of those that you know separately what if i just take those and put them together like you know it, certainly that will yeah. work <laughs> you know <laughs> so. and 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 still when you get into the nes kind of era you can still be a one person development team just like on the 2600 i think past that it starts to get a bit onerous with the music and the graphics and, mm. and the just the size and scope of things that develop and but i think nes is still in that range where it can still be a one person uh, development team yeah i think so uh though i i know nothing about music like i know a little bit about <laughs> you know uh mm. Uh, like arts like I can I feel like I could draw okay you know I, I feel like I could yeah I could put some sprites together you know but when it comes to yeah. music actually even if I was going to make an NES game I would probably have to either like I don't know take a class or something or just learn like the fundamentals yeah. of just how to structure a song you know uh, <laughs> yeah it's a whole other skill set yes. in itself yeah yeah, yeah definitely yeah. Um, a question from Vitoko, um, three by four K cartridge. How did you get into a banking scheme? Which, which banking scheme did you use? If you remember. Which banking scheme? I'm actually not quite sure what, uh, what they mean. Yeah. Cause there's different, there's different ways to rearrange, uh, data in different banking schemes. Um, and they all have different names, but, um, so you may not be aware of which one you picked and, and it just kind of, yeah, that one works. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, uh, I set it up where I think the, 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 the core gameplay kernel and, and code and stuff that drives like the player, um, wound up all going onto one bank. And then I had a, another bank that was basically all full of, the level data you know with the right geometry for each screen and then the uh character uh the enemy placement right so which enemies where and they're uh, right they're kind of uh starting uh, their movement patterns and stuff yeah exactly 
And then so so that's kind of a whole bank. And like the code that loads that into RAM is all kind of one big bank. And then I think the third bank is the uh, start screen and uh, there's a special end screen, too. So it's it's like those two kernels. Uh, and then uh, and then, yeah, I, I kind of have all your functions to do bank switching kind of at the at the top of each each bank. Uh, so, you know, you, you know, make your calls, go back there, do the bank switch, you know, you're in a new bank. And then depending on where you are in that bank, you know, you go to the right spot, you know, in the new current bank. And then when it's done, you return, yeah. go back, you know, switch back to the, to the main, you know, number one bank. And, um, so I don't know if there's uh if that's like a common paradigm, but that's kind of how I wound up setting it up. And Atari 800 XL Rules asks if there's any Easter egg in Mr. Run and Jump 2600, like your initials, or I mean, not let you have to hide it, but uh, people know who made the game. Uh, but, uh, anything extra that you programmed in for people to find? No, unfortunately not. Uh, not in the 2600. There, there's a couple of uh, Easter eggs in the in the new uh, Mr. Run and Jump, but. Uh, Okay. I, I will say, I, I guess the uh, the only thing that maybe counts as Easter egg in the classic one is uh, in the manual, uh, the name of the land. I, I called it the Realms of Color, but the full name is the Realms of Color and Luminescence, uh, which <laughs> refers to the nice. yeah the the color and luminescence registers on the twenty six hundred. Uh, so uh, yes, yes. We wound up just kind of shortening it to Realms of Color because color and luminescence is such a mouthful but uh <laughs> but in in yeah. the manual for the 2600 version it's going to refer to it as the realms of color and luminescence okay the full name yeah there you go so a bit of a bonus there yeah. bonus information exactly uh anything else you want to add that we didn't cover in in our questions about uh, the release no i mean uh yeah i mean both uh Let's see, uh, Mr. Run and Jump, the new one came out uh, last Tuesday, a week ago, uh, last Tuesday. Yeah. Uh, so that's on that's on everything. That's on Atari VCS. Yeah. That's on PC, Mac, Linux. That's on Xbox. You know, all Xboxes uh, or yeah. One and the Series X and all that stuff. That's on PlayStation Four, PlayStation Five, Nintendo Switch. It's, it's everywhere. 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 <laughs> wow. Um, and I think uh, Microsoft is actually doing a promotion, like a summer games promotion, uh, and Mr. Run and Jump is part of that. So um, you might uh, log on to your Xbox and go to the store page and see Mr. Run and Jump there. Um, but uh, uh, so, you know, yeah, I, I encourage people to check that out. And then, uh, yeah, the uh, the classic one, the Mr. Run and Jump classic, I call it, is, you know, went on pre-sale order today, right? So Today? Yeah. To, yeah, today. <laughs> it's supposed to be yesterday, but they, I guess they fumbled something and yeah. wound up being today. So, but, uh, yeah, it was very strange. Oh, we're going to push the pre order date by one day? Very strange. And it, it was, but, uh, yeah. It, it was weird for a long time. Like, you go to that page and it would say sold out instead of coming soon. And it's like, <laughs> yeah, what are you that, doing? Oh, like, no. that's a bit weird. <laughs> that's terrible. That's not oh, good. I missed I missed it. Oh, no. But it's in the future. Ah, yeah. Yeah. So that was very weird. So that I, I think those issues have been ironed out. So you can go uh, onto Atari's yeah. website and you can pre order Mr. Run and Jump. Uh, that's, uh, that pre-order will be available for a limited time. Uh, I don't know exactly when it's going to end, but, uh, I believe they're doing, you know, Hey, once this kind of pre-order window is finished, you know, then we're going to manufacture those carts and ship them out. And then, you know, that'll be it. Um, yeah. So it's, it's kind of a good coincidence that it was delayed till today. Cause you know, we have you on the show. I, I get to, yeah, yeah, I get to. <laughs> share the the announcement you know i guess or the you know the special day with you guys at, at zero pay so yeah. so uh, congratulations on uh, on the release of uh the 2600 version and the modern release of uh, mr run and jump thank you very much yeah it's exciting stuff for sure yeah so um thank you so much for coming on it was a pleasure talking with you and share in the excitement yeah. of the release <laughs> and uh hopefully lots of people go and uh check it out both games and uh enjoy both of them in their both in their different forms 
and hopefully we can uh, play, play Mr. This. Run and Jump I know, I was gonna say. in the future hopefully we'll on the show it soon. very soon. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm. I'm. Uh, yeah, th- thank you very much for having me on the show. Uh, this was a lot of fun. Uh, always great to kind of come on and talk about kind of the origins of Run and Jump and all that. And uh, and uh, and yeah, th- thanks again. Uh, this was a lot of fun. Yeah, thank you so much, John. And we'll uh, talk with you again in the future. Alrighty, take care. Bye bye. Excellent. That was wonderful talking to uh, John there. And uh, yeah, like I showed on the screen, uh, it is available at Atari.com. If you it's treat oh time. Oh. time, yum, 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 yum. Cats can't hear. Oh, they do oh. hear it through the headphones. They hear, hear, through our ears. <laughs> Apparently have, in one ear and out the other. They have good um, cat hearing. They do. They heard that. That's hilarious. Uh, let me just show this for a second. Okay. You flip that back. There Can we go. get it out of the ear? Oh, yeah. Bags? We're done. Oh, okay. We're but done. like. Oh, yeah. hundred percent. Okay, good. Just making sure. It's only for interviews. Only for interviews. Oh, no. I mean, it's just. Yeah. Just make sure that we can still hear. Can hear all the things. Hear all the things. Okay, kittens. Let's just. There you go. Mr. Run and Jump. It is $60 US. Woo! Um, you get a cartridge. You get a box. Don't snub the cats. No. no. It's a, um, a silver cartridge. The more modern uh, yes. e- era cartridges of, of, in the later era of, of Atari, uh, Atari games. Yeah. So it'll match that kind of era. Yeah. Um, oh, they're very, very go. excited. <laughs> so, yeah, hopefully we can... Hello, uh, played on the show very very soon yep and uh go through all the levels and check them out see if i can defeat it there we go just want to say good evening to all the people oh. who joined us in the in the during the interview because yeah. we weren't going to interrupt and, and no so thank, thank you for you for joining for um keeping uh oh my oh, goodness oh, oh my gosh races. okay no 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 oh no one each okay they get one each okay one each shut the door so he doesn't oh. run out okay no, no, kitten, stop it. Do quick. There you go. You're too quick. Okay, ready? We're gonna do one, eight, one all. They, they get one all. Okay, we're starting now. One. One all. One. We're off to the races. There. All right. And of course, Sprite inhaled it. Oh, they're yep. both looking at you. Oh, oh, oh! oh both one again. Two, each. two all. And who, uh, who did it? Gamma Dev. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Oh my God, Sprite already. Yeah. Hungies. Hungy cats. Oh, he's going for it. Come on, Atari. Get in there. Oh, no. Sprite's got four. He hit it with his back paw. Does it count? Yes. Yeah, totally counts. Four, right. three for Sprite. Oh, back paw ring. Never seen that before. Yeah. Five, three for Sprite. Sprite is on it today. He's oh, hungry cat. A little harder. harder. Do it harder. again. Six, oh, three kitty. for Sprite. Oh, I heard that. Yeah. Six, four for oh. Sprite. Seven, four. Seven, four for Sprite. Oh, okay. oh was that him? That he just dinged it? Oh, no, no, they, seven, five. I think he got an extra one. I think he missed one for Atari. Atari yeah. I don't know. That seems like interference from the judge. Eight, That's six. Okay. Eight, six for Sprite. Come on. You can do it. No, not. That's the floor. Hit the bell. Harder. Oh, my goodness. Nine, six for Sprite. It is game point. Oh, nine, seven. Atari's got seven <laughs> points. I don't think he's going to catch up. No. And oh, it's the winner, Sprite. Point. Ten, seven, winner, final winner, score. chicken dinner, and some consolation. It is treats. actually chicken dinner. It is. Oven roasted chicken flavor. <laughs> it's oven roasted chicken flavor. Oh, my goodness. Good kitties. Villainous Good kitties. Dev PA says, I'd like to train my cats like this, but they learn they learn to throw the bell at me. Oh, oh boy, that's dangerous. Did you dangerous. just touch my hand? You know, they're quite smelly. Do you want to lick off the... Uh... The well, treat powder. There's yeah. the link to yeah. uh, Mr. Yeah. Run and Jump 2600. There you go. Oh, open that door again. Oh, my goodness. Sprite for the win by the mile. Yeah, I heard Atari has had a couple of good games. He though, has. In the last while. Really good. Yeah. Yeah. Good kitties. Good kitties. Yeah. They're like, more? Is Don't we get more? <laughs> more, please. Isn't there more coming? So thank you so much to John McCoola. Yes. Um, for being on the show. <laughs> it was. It's uh, always fascinating talking with developers at I any level. Do. Yes. Um, even a beginner level, like he—that's his well, first game. Not, yeah. He's not a beginner programmer. No, no. He's it, a, a very skilled. 
I think advanced it's, programmer. I think but... it's very interesting when you have someone who doesn't grow up with the console that too. get interested in developing for it. Yes. And why? You know, like, is it the challenge of it? Is it just interesting? Is it the coding is very different? You know, who like, there's a challenge there. Own an Atari. No. Who, he had to buy, he bought two before uh, he finally got one that actually worked, third too. Third time's a charm. Yeah. And it's very I, interesting I, to I don't know if he said he had yeah. even touched an Atari in his life. I don't know. He I didn't say that. He didn't but, say that he had. I mean, he's probably seen them, but whether he actually played, yeah, played on one. He's obviously aware of them. Yeah. Hey, it's hey, very hey, neat. Hey, hey. Yeah, that cable. Um, so we're going to uh, now take a look at Zark Stars 4 mm. Nebula. Mm -hmm. This is an exclusive world premiere. Uh, it's by Leandro Camera. Uh, yes. Did programming design and soundtrack. Hey, there he hey is. Leandro. Just in time. Peter Maciel, <laughs> programming consultant. Vivian Pesabes. Uh, design and text consultant. Leonardo Santiago, hardware and programming consultant. Very nice. So let's run nice. that special exclusive world premiere video. Okay, let's get that loaded up. Very exciting. Let's switch it over. So, I'm very excited about this game. It looks so good. I'm very excited. Zark Stars 4. Zark Stars 4. So you've extended past the Zark Stars trilogy. It's <laughs> now, right. I don't know what you even call that now. Part 4 of 3. Part 4 of 3. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if it was always uh, planned to be 4. I don't know. It might have been a trilogy. Maybe you know. The in this, oh, that's right in my way. Oh, sorry. Okay. That's why that was over there. Yeah. There you go. All yeah. right. So load it up. Um, this was first posted July 26th. This build is from July 29th. Nice. Oh, Ooh. oh I can't see it. You did it way too quick for oh, me. Oh, well, there's, yeah, there we go. There we go. All Change right, the starting screen. Woo! Volumes. Quad, 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 I can't even pronounce that villainous stuff. Quad, quadilogy. 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 Not quadrilogy. Quadilogy. Quadrilogy. quadrilogy? I don't know. He typed quadilogy, but it's quad quadrilogy. Is it a quadrilogy? Yes. Not a trilogy, a quadrilogy? Quadrilogy. Uh, it doesn't it's a six... quite roll off. The no, top. it's still very hard to pronounce. <laughs> it's very hard. I think quadilogy is actually easier. Quadilogy is nicer, yeah. Um, it's a 16. <laughs> The fourth installment in the increasingly inaccurate name trilogy. Yeah, Just like so long and thanks for all the fish. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so this is a 16K game, other games he's made. Intruders, Midnight Commando, Orbital War, Polar Rescue, Rally Racer, Satellite Fortress. Zark Stars 1, A Space Saga. Zark Stars 2, Ground 4. Zark Stars 3, Deep Space. Zark Stars 4, Nebula. Nebula. It uh, really smells. Bad cats. Are you going to yep. check and I'll keep reading? Check if there's badness. Bad cats. Stinky bad cats. And also, zero page homebrew, the game. I don't know what you're smelling. Outside? It must be outside. People Something walking bad. their dogs. Oh, maybe or just, just bad air. Maybe he's back there. I trust these cats. No good. I think it's from outside. Good. Um, okay. Uh, hi, James and ZPH team. Here are some tips to get you used to the game. Check if the difficulty switches are BB, which they are. I think we accidentally started games oh, yes. in hard super mode. Super advanced mode, yeah. yeah. But they are. Uh, black white pauses the game, reset starts the game. Gotcha. Uh, not couch compliant. Try and press the button. Not couch compliant! <laughs> 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 um, start the game by training how to hit the probes without losing them at the bottom of the screen. Even without firing the lasers against the barriers. Once you're safe from this action, use the lasers to blast a hole in the center of the barrier. Go through the hole without crashing the ship into the barrier. Don't let the bar reach its minimum on the left. Remove your finger for the button if this happens. It'll make more sense once you see it. Okay. Um, okay, start it. Oh, I'll start it for you. <laughs> start it? No, oh. that's your job. Okay, don't fire, just bounce those guys, hit them. Oh, what do I do? Bounce those guys off of you. Hit them. There you go. So practice that. Oh, jeez. Okay. Oh, easier said than done. Oh. There you go. Try and 
Try the bouncing. This is the instructions. Oh my goodness. Okay. This is the instructions to get us uh, oh. get us used to the game. It just automatically happens. Yeah. There's no pausing in this game. No. So I haven't started yet. Um, this no, is you're just, just, you're just practicing. practicing right now, just so you can get the hang of this part of it. Because the next part is um, shooting. It's like it's like breakout, except your ball doesn't wreck, wreck it. It's like the lasers in Arkanoid. Okay. It's like constant lasers. Okay. Uh, okay. Press the button. Nope. Okay. Now you'll be shooting and bouncing them off of yourself. Hold down the button. There you go. So you got to make a hole in the top, and then bounce those guys through the hole. Oh. Kind of like up, but not really. Um, and also you can readjust where the hole is by going up and down. Yeah. But that's like advanced. Press up and down. Oh. See? Which is kind of a cool oh addition. Because okay. you can shift where the opening is. Oh gosh. Even just, even just, uh, it's cool. Yeah. Great colors in this. In the fire, in the exhaust, in the blocks at the top. Oh, God. <laughs> oh. It takes me a few rounds to get used to it, so... You're going to be resetting when I'm playing. Um, here it is, the mysterious planet. You've been sent into an in inhospitable sector of the planetary system, following coordinates from intercepted transmissions from the command base. The messages point to a planet protected by a belt of energy barriers that prevent them from reaching the source of the transmissions. Uh, to help with the mission, your ship, Nebula NB-7, was equipped with a perforating laser and support scout probes. The probes have the ability to collect information on the molecular structure of the barriers. When in contact with the walls, the probes bring data of, on the fragility of the force field so that you can, with the perforating laser, open a passage and cross along with them to another layer of protection. You will have to cross five energy barriers. <laughs> That's how you use the 2600's giant color palette. Oh yeah, gorgeous. The fire coming out of the ships is just so nice. Especially on your uh, little bouncy guys. Really nice trailing rockets. Oh, goodness, yeah, Definitely so concentrate hard. on the bouncing. Don't concentrate on Well, them. no, because you never get through the barrier because you, you end up hitting them, so you kind of have to... It's, uh, it's tricky. It's very tricky. You'll have to cross the five energy barriers that form the protective belts uh, of the planet. Oh gosh. What the command base did not foresee is that the alien structures... <laughs> I'll get there, I'll get there. Hey, Andrew, make the button reset the game. <laughs> um, I did not foresee as the alien structures were surrounded by cosmic matter transported transport machines. Uh, which could be a serious risk for the mission. What lies beyond the belt of the barriers to be discovered? Lord Computer is watching your movements from somewhere in the universe. Might be easier if the sidewalls were visible, since they are definitely narrower than the allowable screen size. Um, let's see where they bounce. Let's see. Well, they kind of bounce where the edges of the top are anyway, so you don't really need the sides. Ugh. Probably be easy, obviously it'd be easier on a CRT where you can see the obvious cutoffs. Yeah, if you want to do a, a reset with the button from a game that uses the button constantly, what you can do is program a a delay so that oh I it, it says game over or whatever the game over screen and then counts down like two seconds and then it starts looking at the button because by that time you've let go of the button because it's yeah you have to move immediately I know I'm sliding around too is there somewhat something I can put this on yeah you can go upstairs and get the tray okay and I will play in the meantime Yeah, you have to move immediately with them. Because if you don't move immediately with them, you're not faster than them. Of course, they also block your shot. So it's a trade-off. 
So it's like, it's that perfect game mechanic of, of course they bounce off the wall, so if you are missing them, you, are, you do get kind of a chance to catch up when they bounce off the wall. No! Yeah. <laughs> Accidentally shifting. Ah! I mean, it does need joystick up and down to move. Oh, right between them. Oh, wow. Them. This game wants a paddle. Uh, yeah. It really wouldn't work with the paddle because of the need to shift up and down. Yeah, that's true. I don't know if you could do that with something else. Really. Oh, come on! Right in between. <laughs> Too accurate. If the um, point of the game is to get in between them, I'm doing very well. Oh, God. Almost there, though. Uh, it has to be as wide as those ships. Yeah, that's the problem. Wide. It's quite wide. I'm slowly whittling it away. Oh, my God. <laughs> paddle press plus thrust pedal. Yeah, but not many people have the thrust pedal. That's the thing. And if anybody has uh, questions for Leandro, he um, is in the chat about his game. Actually, a uh, good question is, uh, for Leandro is uh, when will this be available? Or a custom controller. Of course, yes. double down. <laughs> Talking about a custom controller for one game. <laughs> of course. <laughs> oh, goodness. I mean, you could have an alternate scheme. Hey, leave the controller alone. Be nice. Be nice to the I'm gonna... Just missed it. Uh, you could have an alternate scheme that would do paddle, but that does change the type of game it is. Because with paddle, it's usually absolute positioning rather than moving, which would make this a lot easier this part. Um, you can also do acceleration with paddle, so that if you move it to the left, and or spin it to the left, it moves at a constant rate to the left rather than... Um, just like um, the alternate control scheme for John Champo's game, um, Turbo Arcade. Um, have you been playing around with the new VCS much? I haven't had a lot of time because I've done two interviews in a row, <laughs> which take up a lot of time arranging them and uh, you do have it working though, coming right? up with the oh yeah, it's totally working. Uh, coming up with the question. Um, if the actually if the interview wasn't going to go um come through today which it was like off and on a little bit um i was going to actually do alien abduction john van risen's game um on the tar vcs so i've been wanting to play that on the screen because it's like um like an unofficial sequel to hero almost with a lot of the same type of gameplay and uh it's really fun very challenging a lot more challenging than I thought when I first saw it. Oh, just missed it by a pixel. Be helpful if you can move the ship at least a little bit faster than the orbs. Yeah, yeah. just a touch faster. Um, but I mean, they, that's they they trail you kind of perfect speed almost. They're so the exact you're same You're late speed. to move. Yeah, you have to follow. You're, you're done. I think that's part of the challenge of the game, is that you are the same speed. Yeah. You can't be just firing, firing, and then catch up to them. You have to be conscious of them at all times. You have to maintain them constantly. 
Mission Part 1, your objective is to open a passage into the enemy barrier with a perforating laser of the ship to later cross together with the probes to the next stage. You start your mission with six pairs of probes. Bounce the probes against the wall without losing them in space. Bottom of the screen. Once the passageway is open, direct the probes through the rift and pilot your ship following them. However, be careful. If the ship collides with the barrier, it will be the end of the mission. Oh, jeez. So you actually have, also have to get through it. pilot your ship after they go out, too. Oh. Oh, right through. I was getting close, too. Um, Can my turn. Sense? Or do you want to play? I want to play. Okay. Because... Nope. I don't it's a lot it. easier with that, actually. Nope, I don't need it. You don't have a flat. You have a flat lap. <laughs> Not quite as crazy. Uh... <laughs> No, it, yeah. it has to sit on one leg or the other, so sometimes oh. that makes it awkward. Yeah. So you're holding the laser continuously. I notice your laser power keeps going down. Yeah, it charges Whereas up really quick. Whereas I tend to start quick, to so stop. It doesn't even matter. Yeah. I just hold it down continuously because well, every brick... Well, I try to time it between them, but it's Every brick destroyed of... is a brick destroyed. This oh. is the world's hardest game! Well, I don't know about that, but it is challenging. <laughs> it's, it's challenging. You want to kind of consolidate your your bullets in one area yeah. if you can so that you're not like wasting the yeah. firepower like going down to zero i don't think there's a penalty for going down to zero i don't know i don't think so i don't think it mentioned you just have to watch before it getting there getting there just has to be wide enough and the fact that you bounce the ships up directly is actually a good bonus. Yeah. You don't have to get through it on an angle. Oh, damn it. So close. Could they bounce off that wall, I would have lost them. Andrew makes very challenging games. Mm -hmm. Oh, come oh, on! Oh, right through! Right oh. at the needle again. Oh, just caught those. You just have to kind of run into them, too. I think it's almost big enough. What do you think? Yeah, almost. You just have Damn to bounce it. him. Off we go! Of course, I didn't read out part two. If I remember correctly from reading the instructions, you have to get those things at the top and bottom. Yeah. And collect them as you go through these. Gotcha. I find the top one the easiest one. Yeah, you're right. Because it has the biggest gap. I'll read the instructions when it's... Because the blue ones give you those health... Oh, Pack things oh. at the bottom. And the green ones, I think, will punch your green bottom. Can you shoot? Uh, no. This, oh. is, this is what you do. Oh, okay, so there's Avoid. no shooting. Very cool graphics in this. Mm -hmm. um, it's like a massive spaceship portal you're going through, or navigating through. Reminds me of those top-down... Um, 8 bit shooters. Okay, made it to right. stage Woo. three. Things are flashing when it hits the top here. Yeah. It's slightly flashing on the right hand side. Power's going down. Oh, I bet it is. Paper. Oh. Okay, go quick. Mission part two? Part two. Now your objective is to advance in space, crossing through the conveyor machines to the next barrier. As the ship moves, its fuel gradually decreases. Energy bar. You will need to fuel the ship frequently by capturing the fuel containers, same color as the bar at the top of the screen. Okay. If the fuel runs out, the mission is over. You will also need to charge the batteries that will be used in the in the next probes. Oh. Capture the battery containers blue at the bottom at the bottom of the screen. The amount of batteries you capture will equal the amount of probes you can use in the next stage. Oh. If you don't charge at least one battery, the game will be over. Oh, I see. Mm. Okay, so the bat things at the bottom are like your 
extra ships. Mm -hmm. Things at the top is your energy. Okay, your turn again. Oh, oh, I died. died. Yep. Oh, one thanks. nine nine seven five. I made it to right. stage three, or Thank stage you. one, part two. Um. Stay tuned. The probes take off on their own towards the barrier and do not remove fragments from it. Only the ship can something. Mission part one, mission part two. Okay, I already oh, got that. I'm distracting myself. The game ends if you lose all probes or if the ship collides with the barrier. Okay, that's right, mission, true. Uh, mission part two. The game ends if the ship runs out of fuel and you don't capture at least one battery. Victory! You win the game if you manage to cross five barriers and the transport zones arriving on the planet. So you have to do it five times. So I did it once. Your distinction will be given according to the amount of batteries charged in the last scenario. Okay. So there's difficulties as well. We're doing it on easy. If you changed the right switch... The left switch. Oh, this is kind of Sorry. You are having problems. Oh, no, it's like, I can't sit with my legs. <laughs> okay, let's try this again. I can reset. No, it's okay. It's too late. Too <laughs> late. It's too late. Expert, already started. Expert mode. Barriers move right alone. So if you do this this level in expert mode, the barriers yeah. move on their own. Oh, they, they like cycle? Yes. And in expert mode, the shot from the ship destroys the probes? Oh, Jeez. so you have to avoid the probes. That is hard. I don't think it's that hard. Yeah. I think you just have to make sure you shoot around them. But, no. it's, but it's not a bullet. It's like a laser. And, and if it runs into anywhere along there. Yeah, I think it's doable. I think, it's, it's I think doable. we should try advance because oh, yeah. I don't think it's... You just have to be very cautious, right? Like, you just can't hold it continuously. Yeah, you just have to be super, super cautious. going between them. Ugh. I've lost I lost almost all my lives by being too accurate <laughs> by being between them. I have, I have to aim for I think we can do it now. Yeah I think so too. Remember you can move the top. Ugh. Fire it, fire it. Just go straight. <laughs> So this is a screen where you can collect more lives, which is good. Why is it right there? That's really annoying. It, it's slower than the big thing, so you can get back to that. Yeah, you can't fly completely up the screen. That would be better. But it's always better to get the blue one first, I think, because the green never seems to go down that much. Yeah. You could survive a whole round by missing the green. Oof. Blue first. Ah, you're close to the green. Oh. Okay, no, no! Oh! 
No, it was done. It was finished. I think you do lose a life. Though. Do you? Yeah. Oh. I, I didn't realize it was... It's a fly through the center. Oh, sorry. The open? Oh, no, middle? I didn't realize that. Oh. I didn't realize it was going to stop. Like, I was like, what's going on? Because <laughs> you can't control it. It just goes forward. Yeah, you can only control up and down. So. Just hit it. Oh, right through the middle. Ooh. Last life. Beat, Beat me. you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to refill my drink. Can you refill mine too, please? Yes. It's empty. It's I made water. myself a fancy little Oh, yes. Mug. Let's show that off. Oh. There you go. Hey. ZPH. ZPH has got sparkles, but you can't really see them right now. Oh, because they float, right? They go through they the... They flow through. Yeah. yeah. You want some water? Yes, please. I'll be right back. Let's see if I can do better. Okay. And then we'll try the hard mode. Yeah. Kind of like break. It's, it's kind of like, like I said, Arkanoid, but you constantly have the laser <laughs> power up. Um, but you also, yeah, and you, but you also have to maintain the ball. But the balls are powerless. It's kind of a uh, weird hybrid of Arkanoid and Breakout. I mean, Arkanoid is an extension. Did I just lose a light from? Overpowering my heaters? My lasers? No, no! Uh, I want to rage reset. Anyway. Yeah, I did lose a probe. That's what I thought. So you, it is, um, you do get penalized. You really do have to watch that. Hold it down and go nuts. And watch. I mean, it's very easy to refill it. You just let it go for like two seconds. So it's better if, like, when they're close to you and you're following. Oh my god! Oh my god! That's when you let go, is when they're close, because you're firing at them anyway. If I keep all five, I already lost the one. But if I keep all five, thank you for following somebody. I can't look because this is a super intense game. Um, thank you for following and enjoying the content. And I think somebody followed as well during the interview, and I wasn't able to say anything. But I'll catch up. Um, and I'm able to. I'll get Tammy to read it out. It's almost open enough. And I can direct them up. Oh, oh I forgot. I can read. Go, go, go. No! It's so distracting. Damn it. Yeah, and then you follow them through. I find this level really, really cool, but uh, fairly easy if you go through this top. 
top one. Not sure why you would go through any of the other ones, because they seem a lot harder. So somebody um, followed, and then somebody also followed during the video. Um, yes. Can you read those names out? How that is. Ah! Sorry. Uh, President... President McCammergill followed. Oh, yeah, they said something in the chat. F. Rosenbrock also followed. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you for following. Yes, 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 yes. Blues. As soon as I say, oh, this part's easy, I die, of course. Yeah. <laughs> Is this um, between one and two or two and three? Ooh, oh, one and two. Mm. Oh, it's almost time. Almost time. Ah, open. Blue one, extra life. Mm. No, I didn't get any extra. What, what is that all about then? What is it it's about the about? the power you get for your probe for this thing? I, think? I didn't get any extra. Oh, no, I don't know if it's extra. And if you do run out of power, we found out that yeah, you do. Really well if you go down to if red. you go down to red, okay, yeah, that so. makes sense. That makes sense. Hey! Pss, 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 pss. The cat's chewing the cables. Why are you chewing cables? It's your job. Watch that cat. No, it's his job to not chew the cables. Well, you can't help. <laughs> um, why are you doing that? He, so he likes the texture. He does. He's like especially braided ones. Very, very tasty. Wrap in a little bit of polyester and Cat food flavor. Cat food flavor. It's roasted chicken dinner flavor. It is. Oh, one color for a second. Ah! No! Yep. Oh, I like. Oh, the colors went up as we went up. Oh my god, it's different. Oh, my god. oh no. Oh my god, it's totally different. <gasps> oh my god. Are you dead? Beer. Oh, what you're terrible at this hell? game. Hey, hey, hey. There. Now it's free. One, two, free. One, two, One, free? Two. Now you can go through. Now get the stuff. The stuff in the blue and the yellow, or you, you'll run out of fuel. And now. Oh, you One millisecond too late. as far forward as I can be. Blues. Oh God, the second one is way harder. Oh, oh, come on! The blue or the yellow? You get it? Get the blue. You can't move, you're dead. I think I made it. I did. Yeah, okay. good. Woo. Oh, they're totally different. Oh, what's happening? Different pattern. This is level three out of five. Mm. Or six? Five. Mm. I, I wasn't really punished because I still have the same amount of lives. Oh god! Same amount of lives I did be when going into that other one. I'm not sure what those blue things mean. No, the I think it's the probe, like the, the your laser? Is it related to how much time you have before your laser goes down? It is. <laughs> it's really good. Oh no! Oh, right through! Oh my god! Oh no! Seems to me the center would be a better option is open enough to pass right through in one shot. Um, on the lasers? Gates, you mean? Mm. Yeah, I mean, they alternate, so I would go up and down. 
how many probes you would have at the next part. Yes, but what does that exactly translate to? Yeah. Because it didn't seem... Ready? Maybe it is the number of probes. Yeah, we're doing advanced, right? Uh, if you want to. Yeah, okay. that's what you want to do. Okay, so I have to. I can't hit them. Let me read the instructions. I don't know how that's going to be really hard. <laughs> One tiny shot at a time. <laughs> oh, good night, Pseudographics. Thanks for hanging out with us. Reread part two again. Mission part two. That's it. Uh, as the ship moves, its fuel gradually decreases. Got that. Oh my god, I should, yeah, you can shoot it. And it'll die? Yeah, you lose your probe. You'll need, to fuel the You'll need to fuel the ship, yeah, the top of the screen. Yeah. Fuel runs out, mission's over. You'll also need to charge the battery that will be used in the next probes. Oh. Capture the battery, blue in color at the bottom of the screen. The amount of batteries you capture will equal the amount of probes you can use yeah. in the next stage. So it is like lives. Oh! So you oh. get all your lives back based so on how many you get. So you don't get extra lives. You just get them back. You literally get, if you only get one, you have one life on the next yep. stage. And then, because that's why it said if you don't get one, then you lose. Oh my god. So you have to get... That's brutal. It's that's good cool. and bad. Because if you're down to one life in this stage, you can get three, four, maybe? No! But if you didn't die at all in this stage, you have all six, you could go down to one by just not retrieving probes for the next uh, level. How is it? I mean, you're making... What do you have? It's like the same strategy as that I was using before. But it's so slow because it's just constantly moving, right? right. So you're you can't just like hit one spot. But it's doable. Ah. Yeah, it's doable. Oh my god. You have to be very careful you don't shoot it. Yeah. It's it, Oh my god, I yeah, shot that. You have to like dodge to the right or left of them and then just make oh. sure you pull your shot before they come yeah. towards you. But I made fairly good did. headway on that. Just time. It takes time. Oh my god. Challenging. Good night, pseudo graphics. Actually, if you, like, fall. Oh god. You can't shoot until you're clear of them. You really can't. Oh, this is so hard. Definitely a good. It is hard. For really advanced players. Kitty. No, he's not. He's chewing cables. He's mm. a bad kitty. <laughs> he hasn't been chewing them, he's just been sniffing. Mm. He's been oh, considering which know. ones he wants to chew. That's right, he's been trying them out, he's sampling. Like, mm, mm, well, this one smells good. This one smells even better. James really hates it when I sniff this one, so maybe this is the <laughs> one I'm going to chew. This must be the best one. Must be the chewiest of the chewy cables. <sighs> okay. You go again. Oh, oh, I'm not going to play hard. No. Oh, I want to play hard. Do you? Yeah, I want to yeah, play Yeah, you did pretty good. I want to see. See if I can at least get past it. We'll see. Although I do have beginner's luck, I find, with a lot of games. Mm. Like, my best, my first try is always my highest score. That does happen. Beginner's luck is a real thing. It's cause, like... Because you're not so concerned about stuff. I don't think it's anxiety, really. It's just like, once you realize how good you can do, you get anxious about screwing it up, so... I think, it's some, I think it's you get too strategic. That is you, something too. That there is something to that too. And you Maybe I need to do it this way. Yeah, and you start <sighs> worrying about multiple things that are going on. It's like, oh, I'm gonna try this and this, and then you don't yeah. stick to just the basics. You're so noisy. No, because I'm not comfortable. Oh, and then now I'm just done. Oh, this is so uncomfortable. <laughs> I need like a better. I don't know what I can do to make it better. Oh, I want to try again. <laughs> this, I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know if these are better or worse. Okay, can you... I'll try one more time. A, B. 
Well, we're trying on super hard. Tenny wants to play this this mode. Like we're just going for a super crazy where we can shoot the ships and the barrier moves. Oh. Larger, heavier enclosures don't move around as much. I don't I don't know if ten, like we've got a heavy one. Uh, we've got one from Atlantic. I don't think you like it. the heaviness of that. No, one. it's it's not having somewhere comfortable to put it is the problem. So I I need a I need a like this is fine. Yeah. It's not the it's not the it's not the the stick. Okay. It's sitting on a couch and trying to use the stick. Okay. Like if it was if it was a desk in front of me, it would be different, right? So. Okay. I just need a better. It's because the table's not sturdy. It's moving. Well, I can't cross my legs under it. It's not wide enough. Oh, so my legs okay. hit the edges. <clears throat> I I just need to experiment and find one that's more comfortable. This one works. One but I have to cr I have to cross I have to cross <laughs> I have to remove the legs. <clears throat> buy that for this? Yeah, what? I use it upstairs too. I but, also use it for working. Yeah, but you, you use it for your you use it for your laptop yeah. sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Not that I'd want to call this a lap desk. Lap desk. This mini desk. Portable, not, foldable not, mini um, desk. The most ergonomic um, setup this with this couch. Yeah, we're playing the hardest because we want to yeah. see how hard. Hard it can be. We played the easiest, which... Yeah, we have done that already. <laughs> I made it to level three. Three? Three of this. Yeah. I didn't make it past... What did I die on? Oh, I did die on this part. On level... Part, part three. Three? Yeah. Yeah. I didn't make it to the flying spaceship part on three. <clears throat> I think if I practice some more... Oh. Ship. No, I'm not gonna get, make it. It's too much. Oh yeah, there's so many bricks you have to so destroy. So many bricks to destroy. If they were still, you could probably have made it through by now, maybe. Oh, I think so. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I've made it through level one before. Yeah, but not with destructive probes. No, if the spinning takes a long time. The destructive pro ah, the destructive probes aren't that hard. It's the yeah. spinning top because you can't just like <laughs> make a path. Focus on one area. Yeah. It's good though. <clears throat> AB is a little less cruel. Yeah. Yeah, yeah the non-moving part. Yeah. Really like good game. It's good. Very challenging. The graphics are are really nice. Mm. Um I like the level I like both levels and I really like level two where it's you're flying through structures mm. like, and barriers that are changing. Mm. Little holdover from other, um, some of his other games where you're flying through barriers as well. Um, the Underground one, I think it was the first, first game he oh, made. Oh, yes, yes, yes. That one's amazing. One. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so, Leandro, when will people be able to uh, buy this? And why is part four out before part three? <laughs> Because I think you are selling this. Mm. Very good. You guys played really well. James went halfway through the game. Actually, pretty much exactly halfway. Made it to level three. Uh, well, five out of ten yeah. levels total. And Tanya played well on hard variation. Mm. Yeah, she did way better than I, I want to go back and keep playing until I can get through <laughs> it. <laughs> oh, I, don't find, I don't find it too challenging, the, the probe shooting. Because... Yeah, uh, you're just bouncing away, but it's yeah. it's it's the time it takes to get through that rotating barrier, that takes quite a bit of time. <laughs> and just like the little touches of collecting things at the top and the bottom while yeah. you're going through barriers and thing and your oh yeah, power there's, there's is going down. Of, yeah, it's there's a lot, lot going on. I like it. A lot like it. to do. It's yeah. challenging and it ramp. You know, seems to be ramping up, especially the um, side side scrolling part that where, got a lot harder yeah i want to see what the three and level. four are now <laughs> yeah yeah oh, that's great leandro wonderful yeah it's, it's really it's one of those games where you you know you can do better yeah and you just want to play that's, one more that's how it gets addictive yeah, yeah it's an addictive yeah. game mm. so um yeah it's really really good mm -hmm. um so we're gonna move on to uh game number three uh leandro hasn't answered how when this is on sale <laughs> yet mm. 
um, but I would like to know. Very good game. Yep, thank you so much again. Um, when is part three and part four going to be for sale? People, that's probably the question people mm -hmm. would want to know the most. Um, so we're going to move on to game number four, which is uh, Food Ninja. And I have something to show about that one. Yes, they. Um, it's being put up by Game Select, and they were at RetroCon convention in Sao Paulo, Brazil, this past weekend, and they were. This was the first place they were selling this Ooh. game. So there you can see. Oh, how look at that beautiful box really art! Really nice box really art. Really nice. Food Ninja. Oh, Ricardo Pan hey, is here. Hey, Ricardo Pan. Welcome. Part, Part four, four is, is now available. available. Excellent. Excellent. How yeah. do they get it? Who do they contact? They have a website? Uh, no. They do. Not. Oh, yes, they do. They have Zark Stars. Zark Stars. Zark dot Has, com. Dot com. Yeah. Okay. And also it's on the Atari Age forums. Excellent. Excellent. Um, yeah, so they were at... Um, this is Food Ninja now. Food yeah. Ninja. Uh, Sao Paulo, Brazil. Um, nice. There's the boxes. There's the back of the really box. Really nice box. looking boxes. Yeah. Didn't show the cartridge, but we do have the cartridge art here. There we go. Food Ninja. Um, and if you'd like to buy Food Ninja, you can email ataregameselect at gmail.com. International sales mm -hmm. will start in two weeks. Local Brazil sales are available right now. Very so nice. in two weeks, Food Ninja. We did have the um, world premiere of Food Ninja um, on the show uh, March 20th, 23. Part three may be early next year. So part four is, is coming out before part three, which I found very funny. <laughs> Okay, so let's load up Food Ninja. Atari Hot Plus. Ready. There you go. You can load that up. So here's the instructions from the last time. They may have changed a bit, but uh, they should be the same. Cut the food. Don't cut the bombs. That's all you need to know to get started with the Food Ninja action. Game select. Great name for company. Press reset. Or the button! Yeah! <laughs> Releasing them in Star Wars order. Yeah. One, two, then four. Cut the bombs. Um, challenge yourself and see how long you can go. Unsheath your sword and get ready for an addictive and action packed gaming experience. Oh, I didn't do any of the uh, news yet. Um, I'm gonna do. While people are still sticking around, I'm going to start the poll question. Oh, yeah, the poll question. Um, should enemy difficulty scale up with your experience level in the game? Did I ask, ask this question before? I don't think so. No. Uh, the answers are one, yes, it keeps the game interesting. Two, no, it negates the point of leveling up. Or three, don't mind it either way. That bomb. Now, um, I've seen games both ways, where almost every game you level, up. you go to the next level, explosion. Um, you get more experience, um, and in some games, the rats just get harder. The rats get harder and harder until you're fighting super rats with every level. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, well, aren't these the same rats? How did they level up too? Oh, I see. Did yeah. they go out and fight a bunch of stuff? Maybe. Um, then there's the other games where you're a basic peasant with no uh, no skills whatsoever. Yeah. Nobody's answering the poll. I think I should save this for the next episode. Put your, put your uh, number in. Um, the other one is where they don't level up. None of the enemies level up. And basically, you just literally can't go into certain areas. You'll just die. You'll get squished immediately. I kind of like that more. Where the areas you go into, it's like, oh, this super crazy character 
you just can't go there. You need the sword, you need to level up first, you yes. need this super spell or something, and then you can go into that area. And it's like almost like no. if you accidentally wander into there. Um, and Ventelko says it depends on the genre. It I was does. I was gonna make that an option, but I think everybody would just yeah. pick that one. <laughs> That's why I didn't make it an option. So you have to pick kind of what you like better in general if uh, uh, game agnostic yes Please. I actually think yeah I don't mind either way I'm, I'm a solid three but I do like mm -hmm. with like I do like games where they're just enemies that are too hard to fight it's like you cannot fight that yet you are not strong enough Yes. And it's like, you stick to the easy dungeons, you do not go into the deep dungeons, because you will die immediately. You just yeah. be destroyed. And, and it could be that there are, you know, barriers in the game to prevent you from going into that dungeon, or it could be you could stumble in there and just die immediately. Yeah, you're like, oh my god, yeah. what? I am And, and now I'm dead, okay, now we know not to go in there yet. You shouldn't have come here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> What's up? You got so many treats earlier. Did I? No. I don't have a memory of that, he says. I don't remember all I am is hungry. Yeah, I see that. No, you're not starving. I know that's not true. But I am. <laughs> belly since I was yeah, uh, seven. I feel like it depends on the game. I do think it depends on the game. It does. A simpler but game, I think it's if you just, like as you say, you're just the rat, you make the rats harder and harder as you go. Hard rats. Yeah. yeah. Ah. Well, um, you know, the spiders and crackpots move faster. And... Well, Is it okay. Crackpots sure, for the yeah, spiders? Crack yeah, yeah. But that's what I mean. That's, that's the... Enemies leveling up right Oh my god, down to three now. Oh, now I'm going Oh, you're doing really well. Oh my god. Yeah, you may not have played this last time. Oh, I did. Oh, I, I did. Oh, I, did. I, I do it? remember playing. Oh, do you? Yeah. I, I want to say... 46. You can do another round if you want. Um, uh, sure. You do another round and I'm just having a sip of lemonade. So. Um... I feel like the swiping is a little different, or or am I just not I'm not remembering it? I mean, it might be subtly different. I don't I don't feel that Did it's it, much um, different. It's, Ri it's Ricardo Pym, right? Yeah. Did it always have that flash effect? Oh, yeah. yeah oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. That's very cool. I like. It wasn't just a point before. Yeah, the dual movement in this game is very interesting. If people haven't played this, but mm. probably haven't. Um, there's two types of movements. What if you press it, it'll swipe. But if you hold it, it'll swipe and then move. Mm. So you have to move near the object and then do a swipe. It's quite it's quite interesting. The button does absolutely nothing. So, but I think it's actually better without the button to do this. The swiping is really ingenious. You just have um, to cross the food way. And it auto cuts. Yeah. Oh god, I missed him. Oh, n what? Twice. Mm -hmm. Oh no, they continued you on. You dropped two. Yeah. It was you almost get three. at the bottom. You get three though. So. Yeah, but. Yeah, you just have to. It was near the bottom. I was yeah. gonna, I was gonna die the next second. I mean, it's still on my fault. I know. <laughs> oh no. no. accidentally moving in the area where the ball is and not even be conscious that you accidentally move. my left no i agree every tower it does look really good yeah the the object um the food graphics we got. We are got great grapes we got limes cherries and a bomb and it accidentally got the bomb <laughs> the bomb does look quite different than anything everything it else. is yeah it's not and like a deceptive too. bomb is that pizza? Mm. Ooh, and I love the um, screensaver. Toss, toss, toss. Root beer, apple. 64. Grapes. Okay. You were going very well Mango. until, you know, the book. Mango. Ramen. Ooh, ramen. Got a burger. I couldn't have thought of playing a game like this without a Wiimote. True. 
Um, but it plays really well. But it does seem like a remote game, like you're pointing it at the screen going... Mango. Or a movement-based VR-type game. Ricardo, you have to change this into a VR game. Oh my goodness! Oh! Oh, I want a 2600 VR game. I'm not sure what that purple thing is. The light purple. Ah! Ah! Yeah, stop it! A large to see what the lights no! are. No! Well, that was terrible! You have to play again. Yeah, I do. Oh, no, he didn't. What? Oh. I was waiting for a natural break to, uh, okay. to cross. Quite a hectic game. I love it. I will make it work with the mind link controller. Uh, you think the mind link controller is sensitive does that, enough? Does that sense your eye eyeball movement or? Uh, it senses your brain um, brainwave patterns very poorly. Very poorly. <laughs> As all of those things did. Uh, most of the games were like super simple, like move the object in a one-dimensional line. <laughs> Um, towards your other opponent and you just concentrate harder and it goes towards them and they concentrate harder and it goes towards you. Oh, come on! Oh, I know you weren't being serious. It's, it's a, not a good product. <laughs> oh, it's and it didn't come out. Either. No. People try. People but, keep but trying. you can make them. <sighs> there is mind link support for Stella. Six, oh, for 20. Stella? Yeah, they oh, programmed it in. That's yeah. Well, you gotta put everything in Stella. Oh, yeah. Um, Got to support everything. I think VR would be pretty fun, though. <laughs> VR. I think when you play an Atari 2600 game in VR, there should be a 2600 controller that you control in VR to play the game. Oh, just like um, That's how the it cat work. game that we played, where you could see me on the screen yeah, controlling yeah, the controller? Yeah, because it's like, I don't think you should be controlling the environment in the 2600. You should be controlling the controller playing. while playing with a CRT in front of you in VR land. That would be fantastic. Oh, I missed it at 10? <laughs> VR 2600 games. Uh, not sure. Says Hyper Tower Collection. Somebody <laughs> made one. Pixel Hmm. Yes, that's that's what I was just yeah. thinking of. Somebody made that, and it's a and it's a computer in front of. Oh, terrible. Start Mind over. Master Woodwork or Tunnel Running. I still like the idea of you just being in a 70s basement. That's the VR world. There's a CRT in front of you. It's all rendered beautifully. You can smell the kind of moldy wood <laughs> frame of the of your basement. Kind of that black, black, brown kind of couch. velour couch. Three shades little of brown. worn, little worn in the middle, sinking in. You know the springs have gone. Yep. And then uh, you pick up your controller and <laughs> play it on the CRT. So, okay, I'm, that's what I'm developing that's now. Kind of what I, that it's just going to be Tanya's VR basement, and it's VR just going to be all the consoles, and you just pick them up and you play them. Good luck getting the licensing for that. Well, you have to have big games. Or a whole bunch of homebrew games. <laughs> License it. A whole ton of homebrew games. <laughs> oh. You have the difficulty switches to pair the game with your skills up experiences. Uh, the game select menu from the Activision collections in the mid aughts. Yes, exactly that. Exactly that. It's, yeah. It's just, no. It's just the room you go into to. Um, this is on hard difficulty. On hard? I don't think so. We were, I don't know if it has multiple difficulties. I'm doing one. Big bowl of checks mix on the, uh, on the table in front of you. A bunch of seventies snacks. Oh yeah. Short, stubby um, pop cans with pull tabs. Yeah. Maybe there's big hi fi in the background with a record player next to you know, attached. Somebody's made that. Somewhere. It's part of some, oh, I know. some VR game. Oh, for sure. Because they've made games with arcade games inside games already. Oh, multiple yes. Times. Oh, yes. It just, you know. 
What music will be playing off that turntable? Ooh. Ooh, that's a good question. I mean... Probably rock music of some sort. Well, I'm more of a late 70s girl. It would be ABBA for me. Okay. But that, that, I would say most people would probably go for, like, the classic rock. Late Curtis. 70s. ABBA's almost more 80s. I don't know. No, yeah. they were around all through the 70s. Anyway. Yeah. Yeah, I'd have ABBA play. No! No! Ah! Uh. Yeah, you have to remember Queen. The... Oh, Queen, God. I would be down with Queen, too. Queen would be pretty awesome. No! Ah! Uh. Yeah, Queen. Traffic for the police. Yeah. One more for you, one more, and then one more for me. 64, though. That kicked that, butt. Yeah, I did very well. I love this game, says F. Rosenbrock. You put a sword and a strawberry on the screen. It's pretty that's, awesome. That's pretty cool. Yeah, the um, late night cityscape with the sun going down. The kind of almost. Oh, come on. Six. I don't know if that, that's supposed to be like uh, at the bottom, like a shelf or a sidewalk. But it, it gives a nice 3D effect of, with the yellow color. It is very crackpots esque. The the whole city scale oh, and, and the, the gray wall. Ah, I hate uh, it when it comes out to, and goes to the side. They're so hard oh. to catch. Yeah. No, it was it was far the other end. Yeah, a low one on the right and a low one oh, at the left. Oh, you're just like you're come dead. on. You, lit you literally <laughs> can't get it. Ooh, Zeppelin, yeah, Deep Purple, Black Sabbath, yeah. Those are 70s. Oh, yeah, no, that's good. I remember playing most of my 2600 games to another one bites the dust. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Queen's good too. Um Yeah, more more poppy stuff. That's what my mom used to play. Abba, Elton John. 80s synth pop for me. Well, that's that's later. That's later right? Yes, it yeah. is. But I mean, if you're going with the 70s vibe. Yeah, yeah, you have to have to make it craft work, appropriate. Some craft work in there. Uh, I don't know. Sure. <laughs> Not my favorite, but they're fine. They're very minimalistic. I find. <laughs> Very simple. What else came out? I mean, lots Very of punk in the 70s. I'm not sure oh, that, suits, for punk, then. that suits the basement vibe, but... Uh, a oh, dog. explosion! It's over? One? Did I... One bomb kills you? Yeah. <gasps> That's it. No. Well done. Ricardo Pim, I suck at playing this game with an arcade controller. I really need a CX-40. Oh, really? Ooh, Bowie. Yeah, Bowie, Bowie would be good, work. too. Bowie will work. That'll work for Bowie. me. I'm just so used to our uh, arcade controllers. I pretty much mm. played everything on my C64, which was uh, this style of joystick with a ball on the top. It had a, actually a trigger on the top of the ball and at the base, so I could pick it. I'm just so used to it and playing in the arcade. And playing um, Atari, which is a stick. Um, I played more Atari than any of us. You did? Yes. Mm. Much more. Yeah. Just because of the era. Mm -hmm. And I never had uh, an NES. I didn't have any. Well, any I, had, consoles, I had an so. NES, and all I all we ever had, I think I've said this many times, was a Commodore 64 and an oh. NES, so. Uh, no! I'm not even at the challenging part. Still at two. Two objects. I've lost all my lives. Oh, I think it's three now. Nope. No! No! <laughs> Hard. Oh, I think I'm gonna good. I think I'm gonna 64. Bow out at 64? Uh, yeah. Okay, I'll play one more round and then <laughs> I'm not gonna get 64, mind you, but let's see. It's making me hungry too. For some reason I'm craving. Grapes and ramen, apparently. So, what movie TV show would be playing on another TV? A Team? Oh, oh uh, maybe. I mean, in the 70s. In the 70s, I don't know. I would definitely have, like, Six either million. Star Wars or. Six million a little dollar later. Man. A little later would be Back to the Future. That's definitely 80s, but um, something of what, like, 
movies that I like. Star it would probably be talk about movies or TV shows? Seventies seventies movies, eh? No, I I'm think. TV shows. You, TV, you can't you wouldn't be watching movies on the TV. That's a good point. It'd be very rare. I mean like you would. TV shows. Seventies TV shows. Charlie's Angels. Battlestar Galactica. I watched a ton. Incredible Hulk I watched. Um, ah, Wonder Woman. Wonder Woman. Um, I mean, oh, well, let's not get into cartoons. Name them forever. Uh, what else? Well, Muppet Show. That was a cartoon. So that kind of counts. Oh, the Muppet Show was awesome. Dukes of Hazard. Chips. Oh yeah, Dukes of Hazard. Ugh. Chips. There's a lot of that. WKRP. Oh yeah, that was a good one. Uh, what about Welcome Back, Cotter? <laughs> I didn't watch that all of much. Those, all of those played in the 80s, which is why I know them. Yes. I mean, I mostly know them from the 80s, but I did watch a lot of these in the 70s yeah. as well. I like WKRP. Yes, very good. Um, I mean, I'm watching that when I was older, but... Um, we don't talk about the Star Wars holiday special. Yeah. I still have not set through the whole thing. It's, oh, it's so bad. It's so brutal. Yeah, it's so bad. It's torture for your mind. <laughs> it's Whatever. so bad. I don't know if I could make it through it. I've watched lots of bits of it. But, oh, Ooh, you almost died there. I almost got it, too. Almost got that bomb. Yep, mash. Oh, oh no. no! Twilight Zone? I didn't watch that till later. I, I, I may have... Yeah, I know I watched that in the... Maybe the 80s. I don't think it would appeal to me to keep it. too much. That'd be more like 10 years and older, maybe. Maybe 9. Which would put me in the 80s. Sunny and Cher Variety Hour. Uh... Well, we could get into Canadian content. Oh! But, which none of you would know. The Beachcombers. Oh, the Beachcombers. Yep. Um, the Smothers Brothers. Ah! Oh, uh, what's the Canadian? 54. The Canadian. Ronnie's? No. What well, that's it? British. That's British. There's old British as well that I would be watching. SCTV! SCTV! Carol Burnett! Brady Bunch! There you yeah. go! <laughs> Gilligan's Island. Gilligan's Island, hundred oh, percent. I'll do one more. Okay. Mm. Gilligan's Island, hundred percent. SNL yeah. when it was funny. <laughs> Everyone says that. Whatever era they watched it was SNL never in. Funny. It's never funny. <laughs> Everyone thinks their era of SNL was like the greatest. Best of SNL is fun. SNL itself is not. Funny. Oh, kids in There's the hall. There's a lot of filler. But that's uh, 80s, that's, not 70s. That's uh, late 80s. I could still watch that forever, though. Oh, yeah. Oh, so funny. Monty Python. Yeah. These 70s or 60s? I guess they're 70s. Monty Python? Yeah. 60s. Yeah. yeah. So mm. 70s. Mm. Early Monty Python. Later seasons are bad. I don't even know what the state is, RC70. The state? Of no. what? Oh, the state a TV show? Uh -huh. I'm not sure. Ah, no! I missed whatever that was. Pudding? Yeah. Lauren Michael says, when you were in late junior high to high school is when you find SNL the funniest. 100% uh, true. It's the attitude. 100% true. It's the sense of humor. It is. The sense of humor appeals to you. MTV's The State. Oh, what don't know I don't know that one. No. Everyone that was on that show. Mm. Oh. Didn't watch a lot of MTV. I mean, we did. No, we you didn't, get it, didn't so. really get MTV in Canada. We had much music. Much music. Uh, sometimes you would get MTV stuff on much music. Some of the shows yeah. until they had a Canadian MTV. In it. I get lucky. I'm really frightened me because I could get unlucky with the bomb. Yeah. I ah, remember remote bombs. control on MTV Sandler started there. Oh. Oh, really? uh, Monty Palmer debuted in 69 but didn't make it to the US in the mid Okay. Uh, 
88. The love boat. Maybe? Love boat. Yep. BJ and the Bear. I never watched it. I knew of it. Oh, All go. right. All right. 88. 88. Good job. Pretty good. That is a good run. It, uh, Fantasy Island. Mm -hmm. Yes, we watched that. Mm -hmm. Oh, what is that thing? Didn't big make thing. it to that never thing. Never got a big thing. Oh, no. no. What is that big chonky thing? Is that a boss? It might be a boss. I don't know. Does it hurt you? The big cheese? You probably have to get to 100 to get <laughs> it's to it. the big cheese. Mm. It probably is 100, yeah. Ricardo, what is that big thing? How do you get it? Do you have to get to 100 to see that? It's so big. Looks like a thwomp. Oh, it giant does. pumpkin! Oh, oh, a pumpkin. A little bit more. Probably 100. 100. Yeah. Oh, no. So close. Nice. Looks like a thwomp. Yeah, it does look like a thwomp. Like so, in uh, Mr. Run and Jump, he had some thwomps in there. I was like, oh, okay, there's definitely a Super Mario vibe going on there. Yeah, I did have some thwompy oh, kind of guys. Mm -hmm. mm. Five cuts to kill it, so you have to go... Oh, no. Nice. Oh, my God, that's nice. tough. Um, so I did have some um, news. Oh, you never got to the news? Oh, but I have to do it now, because <laughs> news, news. news goes Late away. Late breaking news. That's right. Yeah. Late breaking news. Um, where is it? Where is it? Here it is. So the movie cart. Oh, the movie cart is done, <gasps> and it's what? ready for people to use. Um, our bio mm -hmm. says update a finished version two of the PCB board. Highlights easily accessible SMD SMD parts can be made in assembly house cheaply. Use a revised kernel with background plus PF colors. Drop in compatible combat cart. Super fast, reliable boot up. Now I'm wondering where to go with this. So he's saying, should I make a shell? Uh, should it be PAL compatible? Should I sell them through Atari Age? Tindy, not sure what that is. Um, content, I wouldn't be able to ship with any copyrighted materials, yeah. but users would be tasked with encoding. Obtain obtaining their own content. So if you make it easy enough to encode your own content, that's great. That's really cool. He obviously is in Canada. He's delivery from Canada. Uh, what price would people generally expect? And mm. then some blah, 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 blah. Um, so uh, he's not going to make a package for it, but he's leaning towards a fully assembled PCB, which is, makes it easier for people to use it. And people can su supply their own cartridges to put it into. An SD card with a demo video, that's a good idea. Um, and a label, that's nice as well. 16 gigabyte card is roughly 10 hours, that's plenty. Um, a link to online instructions, how to include the PCB into a standard combat shell, how to create custom video, how to upgrade firmware. Mm. Maybe an initial run of 15 and $25. That seems very reasonable. That seems incredibly reasonable. Yep. And it's, yeah. and it's kind of a, just a fun thing. Shipping will be extra. Yeah, that's understandable. It's, it's a video player for the 2600. Mm. Um, you encode your own video. Uh, he could Public include, domain uh, movies, yeah, oh, possibly. Night of the Living Dead. Yes. That's a perfect one to include. Yes, yes. Oh, somebody needs to... Uh, Encode that for... Yeah. I'm going to put it right now. Okay. You could include... Thank you so much, Ricardo Pim. Night that was a lot of fun. We really enjoyed it. Living Dead on the SD card. It's public domain. Suggestion by Gamma Dev. They're coming to get you, Barbara. <laughs> there we go. Great suggestion. That's a really good mm. idea. Um, thank you for that suggestion. I gave you credit, <laughs> as everyone should. Um, the seven J, uh, JS seven thousand eight hundred. Uh, emulator online emulator has been updated by Razord. Um, mm. New version 0.0.5. .0 Doesn't think too highly of his updates. He's nowhere near finished. <laughs> it's not uh, even one yet. <laughs> not even point one. Not even point one. Uh, bank set support. Maria uh, Maria background color fix for Keystone coppers. Cartridge headers fix fixes several ROMs that require special versions. Improved color. Uh, improve cycle accuracy, resolve several game glitches, still not perfect. YM215 ones homebrew auto detect support. That's awesome. Pokey filter support, contributed by Revenge at Atari Age. Support for 7800 diagnostic cartridge. That's cool. Save state support. 
only accessible via a web arcade currently added to the default game list ie 78 demo bad apple demo bank set test baby pac-man 7800 keystone coppers demo galaxian pentago oh that's great updated several games to the latest version added high score support for 1942 galaxian keystone coppers pentago latest versions of games that were already supported and he's provided some links to attack the pet ski robots demo mm -hmm. ie 78 and bad apple so let's uh mute that because <laughs> i don't know if it's gonna it's gonna hit so there's the um 7800 version of bad apple playing mm -hmm. in em uh javascript emulator nice. online in the web page that is awesome um because on my list of 7800 games that i keep track of if they provide a binary that's available i link it to the javascript's js7800 website so people can just click play the game instantly nice of all the new games coming out nice this is a demo of course yep we'll play that oh we're sinking in our seats hey where's my name oh yeah it has been there the whole show did you point that out i think i i, I tried to turned off me you you turned off you and then left Erlen on so it said Tanya Erlen, and then you deleted you and then I tried to point it out but it was right as the show was starting yeah. so I've been doing the show by myself <laughs> I've been unnamed unnamed Anonymous no one knows host. who you are no yeah. no <laughs> um sorry I, 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 I meant to point it out after you, you started but I forgot yeah that's fine yeah that's okay so let's see what's coming up on the Yay. show made it through all the uh pending interviews which are very stressful. Are are you going to <laughs> a lot of work. try out the VCS on the, on the show at yeah. some point? In the next 2600 stream, we're going to play John Van Ryzen's uh, Alien Abduction okay. game. Is that what it's called? Um, uh, and that's on the VCS? And that's on the VCS only. Oh, okay. Um, so I haven't even seen it yet. And I'm kind of curious to like it's, try it out. It's like Hero except a little bit harder and there's a lot more things mm. to do on there mysterious bearded man mm -hmm. this mysterious bearded i man. think we're going to do a 7800 show next because we haven't played mm. 7800 in a while okay i'll have to see if there's some other games we haven't played because not a ton of 7800 mm. has been put out or worked on everybody's taken their um their breaks right now mm. so someone's asking about how much the vcs was uh too much <laughs> for my for what i'm using it for um i got it with 25 percent off um luckily when i took it across the border because you can't order to it you can't get it ordered to delivery outside of the u.s oh only u.s so we had to run the border yeah we had sneak, to send sneak it, over and sneak past send it to my p.o box yeah luckily they didn't charge any duty which I was quite surprised, but it was just one item we were bringing. It was just so. one item, yeah. Um, maybe we'll play Attack of the Pets actually. Robots and combine that with Drelbs. Because we yeah. really haven't played Attack of the Pets Robots. On the 7800? Oh, yeah, on the 7800. Yeah. Um, mostly because my version is a very early version. Duty free. <laughs> and it's kind of messed up. Oh, like the yeah. Commands are not uh, the, the right. The controls buttons. aren't quite right. Yeah, because yeah. it was early. I got it at yeah. PRG. And I remember were, that. They're rushing to get it done. Yeah, I remember that. And so it was kind of a. There's kind of an error in the. Yeah. It's playable. Like, but, it's fully but it playable. was, it's it was weird. not as smooth. It was, no. yeah, yeah. Uh, how much was it by? Oh, uh, the game. <laughs> oh, um, I think it was like. It was a, one of the more expensive ones for homebrew. Mm hmm. Um, Dianoids games were like five dollars Canadian. John Van Ryzen's were like eight, and I think Bob DeCrescenzo's was seven dollars. Mm. They're all very reasonable prices. Mm. Like, don't get me wrong. To download them, yeah. Yeah, to download them, especially if you think about that in American dollars yeah. too. It's very inexpensive compared to like buying a, a binary elsewhere. Comparing yeah. prices, yeah um let's see what games i've added um like there's updates what am i looking at here i don't know what you're looking at am i on the right list yeah i am okay 
just in the wrong oh it's not showing the page numbers that's why shrink it down yeah it is pretty cheap um i had al send me the newer version card mm -hmm. uh, only as part of my large order recently oh, oh that's nice oh i could oh i um <laughs> i wore the cartridge design today in celebration i suppose or in honor yeah. of the first new cartridge put out by atari so this is for the mr run and jump schematic of the atari cartridge it's a schematic of an atari nice. cartridge by atari Very this nice. is the um uh, patent for yeah. the cartridge yeah um yeah because of that i i try and theme it a bit theme uh, the t-shirts yeah theme <laughs> the t-shirts a little bit yeah drelbs uh, there's a drone patrol update but some of these are like minor things that mm. don't really change what we looked at last time i have to pull out a couple of things oh, yeah that's a video only yeah I th yeah we'll see we'll see what happens anyway we'll see exploded view yeah it's an it's kind of, it is an exploded view so you could has all the um part numbers and they're i'm sure they're listed Neat. in the patent yeah yeah because i also have one for the 2600 exploded view patent and also these in prints which i took down off the wall yeah because they used to be right here now mm -hmm. there's a nice big sign there is a very big sign technically i consider the release of aqua venture as the first new cart release since that game never officially got released in the past by them or anyone else no they was not released but it was made back in the 80s though it's not a new game this is a new game but mm -hmm. it depends on your qualifications you know if an old game being released now is a new game mm -hmm. but i'm not counting those games in the atari homebrew awards because mm -hmm. they're not new games they're true. ancient games yeah true. But should i connect uh um count them i don't know i don't know it's all subjective <laughs> it's all hard to tell um but either way we're gonna be back on friday yes with darcy, um, with RC yeah. and we'll see what uh system we'll be playing on 7800 8-bit links jaguar probably not jaguar because we just did a jaguar show so links 7800 um or atari 8 bit one of those ancient ancient this is our child that is our childhood mister <laughs> ancient relative <laughs> 50 years ago oh no it'd be it would be late 80s um be 83 so mm. it'd be 40 years ago yeah 40 years ago mm. yeah that's still a long time uh, that's a long time um <laughs> thanks for hanging out everyone <laughs> um fairly long show three hours yeah um ivory tower collections gamma dev rc70e double down prow 7 rendered ghost uh atari 2600 dude uh el camara leandra camara thank you so much for yes. letting us debut your Yay. really fun game super fun we wanted to keep playing a bit yeah. we're already at three hours yeah so. <laughs> um uh trey guy ricardo pam thank you so much as well as well for sending over the final mm. build of fruit ninja awesome food ninja food ninja yeah. fruit ninja oh getting no. confused again <laughs> food ninja because the fruit ninja is a different yeah game. yeah um atari 2600 dude rc7e in there a lot of same people f rosenbra yes thank you for following thank you so much Azure. Um, uh, graphics chelsea donny mao proud seven toko bl614614 yep we're 614 yeah and that's the top Yay. So he's not he's not yeah, Dapa anymore. Know. He's villainous Dapa. Villainous. Yes. Villainous Dapa. <laughs> Love it. Um wait, do you not know Fruit Ninja? The state, I understand, but Fruit Ninja. Oh no, we know Fruit Ninja. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's I just, was just mixing up the, the, what which name was Ricardo's the correct one. <laughs> yeah. Because he has to come up with a yeah, different Fruit name. Fruit Ninja's been around a long time. <laughs> yeah. Are you gonna upload the interview games separately on YouTube? Never. No, that's work. Um I upload it. And I has one group <laughs> i i time stamp it so yeah. you can jump ahead it's well the it's whole chapters. thing will be in there yeah. yeah yeah whole thing all is one chunk yeah 
And uh, timestamps, you can jump ahead. Yeah. It makes it easy. Result of the poll? I just have to... Um, Disappeared. We're not even on the chat. Why is there nothing on the screen? Oh, my God. What is going on? Oh, terrible. It's all gone crazy. Yeah, I, it's because of the names, and I got mixed up. <laughs> Time to retire. Um, the winner is Don't Mind Either Way, which I kind of thought people would pick that one. Yeah. Um, I'm a three, too. Yeah. Half of people picked that one. Uh, no, it uh, negates the point of leveling up 33%, um, which is the one I would pick. Yeah, two. I'm going to break the stats now. Yeah. Oh, 42.9 is tied. Oh. Um, it's and, it. and last place, yes, it keeps the game interesting 14.3%. Mm. Substandard broadcast. It's all going wrong. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> down the tip. Down, Down the, the toilet. Tubes. Yep. It's all over now. <laughs> um, so tune in on Friday. Mm -hmm. We'll be back. More homebrew games. Mm -hmm. More fun. More cats. Hopefully. Oh, he's so sleepy well on the floor there. Cats. Look at that little sleepy like, cat. Uh, oh, don't touch my paws. I'm so sleepy. He's like, are you giving me more treats? More cats. More treats. Yeah. More Darcy's. And uh, a lot more fun. Yep. So we will see you then. So tune in Friday. Have a great week, everyone. Yes. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.